EN atau English. Silahkan klik pilihan ID jika Anda ingin mendengarkan seluruh sesi dalam bahasa Indonesia. Dan silahkan klik pilihan EN jika Anda ingin mendengarkan seluruh sesi dalam bahasa Inggris. Yang terakhir, jika Anda mengaktifkan fitur ini, pastikan Anda berbicara sesuai dengan pilihan bahasa di fitur interpretasi simultan yang telah Anda pilih. Terima kasih dan selamat mengikuti webinar TSN series kelima. Before we start this webinar, let me introduce the simultaneous interpretation feature on the fifth TSIN series webinar. First, kindly click globe icon on right below your screen and you will find options between ID for Indonesia and EN for English. Next, kindly click ID option if you want to hear the whole session in Bahasa. And kindly click EN option if you want to hear the whole session in English. If you choose to activate this feature, please speak in the language that you have chosen. Thank you and enjoy the fifth TSIN series webinar. Indonesia is the largest archipelago in the world. It is located in the equator with the tropical characteristic. And be blessed as mega biodiversity country. is known as the world's leading fish producer and seafood exporter. Indonesia's seafood sector is complied with best fishing practices. Good aquaculture practices. Good handling practices. good manufacturing practices and with international standards or requirements as well. Indonesia's stakeholders are committed on sustainability by practicing fisheries sustainability improvement in collaboration with international partners. In line with the commitment and continuous efforts, we proudly present to the world Indonesia Seafood, naturally diverse, safe, and sustainable. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat siang dan salam sejahtera untuk kita semua. Kami ucapkan selamat datang kepada Ibu Artati Widiarti sebagai Direktur Jenderal, Direktorat Jenderal Penguatan Daya Saing Produk Kelautan dan Perikanan, Kementerian Kelautan dan Perikanan. We also would like to say welcome to our speakers from abroad, Dr. Regan Crooks as Chief Executive Officer of Future Feed Australia, Welcome to Stephen Cron, PhD, as Chief Scientific Officer at the Seaweed Company, Ireland. And also welcome to Steve Miller, PhD, as Chief Executive Officer at CH4 Global in USA. Serta selamat datang kepada moderator pada hari ini, Bapak Sudari Pawiro, sebagai National Chief Technical Advisor di Unidos GQSP Indonesia Smart Fish 2 serta para pembahas yaitu Prof. M. Aslan Laude yang hari ini juga hadir sebagai profesor dari Universitas Halu Oleo serta Bapak Dr. Retnat A.B. Susanto sebagai dosen dari Fakultas Perikanan dan Ilmu Kelautan Universitas Diponegoro. 
Serta kami ucapkan selamat datang kepada seluruh peserta di acara webinar TSIN series kelima dengan tema The Potential Development of Asparagopsis Seaweed for Sustainable Livestock Feed Production to Reduce Methane. Perkenalkan, nama saya Lara Sati Puspita Dewi yang hari ini akan menjadi pemandu acara webinar TSIN series kelima. Acara ini akan berlangsung hingga pukul 3 sore nanti, jadi pastikan Anda mengikuti seluruh sesi karena akan ada materi menarik dari para narasumber dan tentunya pembahas. Dan di akhir acara akan ada pembagian sertifikat dan juga merchandise bagi lima orang penanya terpilih dan lima orang pemenang kuis. Selanjutnya, perkenankan saya untuk menjelaskan secara umum mengenai Tropical Seaweed Innovation Network atau TSIN. TSIN merupakan web virtual yang menghubungkan antara jejaring kerja pusat atau lembaga penelitian dan pengembangan dengan para peneliti dan pakar rumput laut di seluruh Indonesia. Saat ini tercatat sebanyak 205 expert dengan 7 keahlian dan 19 lembaga penelitian dan pengembangan telah bergabung di web virtual ini. TSIN dapat diakses dengan mengunjungi laman di www.seawednetwork.id. TSIN yang secara resmi diluncurkan oleh Menteri Kelautan dan Perikanan pada tanggal 13 Desember 2019 dapat menjadi media untuk saling bersinergi dalam rencana aksi perpres nomor 33 tahun 2019 tentang roadmap pengembangan industri rumput laut nasional tahun 2018 hingga 2021, khususnya terkait jaringan atau network dan inovasi produk rumput laut. Hal inilah yang mendasari terlaksananya webinar TSN Series. Dan itu tadi pengenalan mengenai Tropical Seaweed Innovation Network yang selengkapnya dapat Anda lihat dengan mengunjungi website-nya yaitu di www.seawednetwork.id. Selanjutnya, saya akan menyampaikan agenda webinar kita pada hari ini. Jadi setelah ini, kita akan bersama-sama mendengarkan sesi sambutan. Dilanjutkan dengan presentasi yang akan disampaikan oleh ketiga narasumber dan juga pembahasan yang akan disampaikan oleh kedua pembahas. Dan di akhir acara nanti kita akan ada diskusi interaktif dengan para audiens. Baiklah, sebelum kita melanjutkan ke sesi berikutnya, mari bersama-sama kita foto bersama. Jadi mungkin boleh Bapak dan Ibu sekalian menyalakan uh, kameranya untuk dokumentasi seperti itu. Oke, kita mulai dengan slide yang pertama. Satu, dua, tiga. Jangan lupa senyum ya. Oke, next slide. Satu, dua, tiga. Oke, mungkin boleh diangkat jempolnya untuk slide selanjutnya. Satu, dua, tiga. Dan yang terakhir, lebih semangat lagi. Satu, dua, tiga. Oke, terima kasih semuanya untuk partisipasinya dalam foto bersama. Baiklah, setelah ini mari bersama-sama kita dengarkan sambutan dari Direktur Jenderal PDS PKP, Ibu Artati Widiarti yang siang ini juga sudah bergabung bersama kita. Kepada Ibu Artati, kami persilahkan. Silahkan Ibu Artati. Baik, silahkan di unmute, Oke. Okay. Baik, terima kasih Mbak Laras. Bismillahirrohmanirrohim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning. Good afternoon and also good evening for all of us because we are coming from uh, around the globe. Honorable speakers, Dr. Regan Crooks, the CEO of Future Feed Australia, Mr. Stephen Cran, PhD, Chief Scientific Officer at the Civit Company Galway Metropolitan Area, Ireland, Mr. Steve Mellor, PhD, President and CEO at CH4 Global Inc. the United States of America. Honorable discussants, Professor Aslan from Halu Oleo University and Dr. Susanto from Diponegoro University. Colleagues from Ministry and Agencies, Provincial and District Marine and Fisheries Services, researchers, academicians, civil industry and association, 
distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, ibu dan bapak sekalian. Ini karena um, Uh, uh, audiensnya uh, campur, jadi mungkin izin saya uh, pakai bahasa Inggris uh, biar dimengerti oleh uh, speaker kita. First of all, let us always praise the Almighty for His blessing so that we are here at this important webinar on the potential development of asparagopsis seaweed for sustainable livestock feed production. We are lucky today to have prominent speakers and discussants who would like to kindly share their expertise in seaweed industry. We will also have a wonderful moderator, that is Pak Sudari from UNIDO, Global Quality Standard Program Indonesia. This webinar is the result of an excellent collaboration among ministries, agencies, UNIDO, UNIDO Indonesia, I mean, CBI, seaweed, Research and Development Center, Civit Association, and Business Operators. Ladies and gentlemen, Civit uh, is one of the strategic aquatic commodities according to many reasons, such as for economic, social, and environmental purposes. As an incredible plan, Civit has lots of benefits for human beings and the planet. While in the water, seaweed works by reducing the ocean acidity. Meanwhile, after harvested, seaweed can be processed for ingredients with 100 applications, including for cattle feed to reducing atmospheric pollution from methane emission. Even the waste of seaweed processing would also be used as fertilizer. According to the Indonesian Institute of Science, Currently, there are 911 seaweed species in Indonesia. It means that Indonesia possibly develops various derivative products from this very large seaweed biodiversity. For this reason, I am delighted to see the Tropical Seaweed Innovation Network, or TSIN, here actively keeps on exploring the potential, potential and the utilization of seaweed for food, feed, fertilizer, biodegradable materials, cosmetic, pharmaceutical products, and many more. This is very important to increase value addition of seaweed industry, especially in Indonesia. Distinguished participants, as we are aware that development of research resulting so many valuable ingredients which could be derived from various seaweeds for a better life and sustainable fashion. In line with that, increasing seaweed, pro seaweed production is needed to meet the rising industries. I believe that the world market of seaweed industries is significantly increasing. However, there is different figures on the value of world market for seaweed depending on the source of data. It could be seen as a very fast growth of product development in the seaweed industries. Currently, the use of seaweed for human consumption is estimated of 77% in the total global market. But the use for other applications also increased significantly, such as what we are going to discuss today. According to scientists, Asparagopsis taxiformis is the most effective type of seaweed in reducing methane. This type of seaweed is able to inhibit up to 90-90% of methane production in animal metabolism in vitro. This is according to Rock et al. 2021. The use of Asparagopsis taxiformis facilitates the production of high-quality protein from coals in the form of ruminant meat and milk. Therefore, this type of seaweed plays an important role in reducing global warming in the future. Distinguished seaweed lovers, in this opportunity, once again, I would like to thank and convey my sincere appreciation to the speakers, discussants, moderator, participants, and all parties for making today's webinar happen. Last but not least, I hope this webinar will be inspiring to develop more 
asparagopsis and seaweed farming, as well as their processing industries for a future better life. Happy webinar. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Saya kembalikan ke Mbak Laras. Baik, terima kasih Sini, banyak Bu Artati untuk sambutannya. Baiklah, sebelum kita melanjutkan ke sesi presentasi dan juga diskusi, saya ingin kembali mengingatkan bahwa Anda dapat mengaktifkan fitur interpretasi simultan dalam webinar kali ini yang cara aktivasinya sudah di-share melalui chat room, jadi dapat langsung di-download dan dibaca untuk mengaktifkannya. Baiklah, kemudian untuk sesi selanjutnya akan dipimpin oleh Bapak Sudari Pawiro. Sebelumnya perkenankan saya untuk memperkenalkan beliau, jadi beliau menempuh pendidikan S1-nya di IPB University, dengan jurusan Food Technology dan meneruskan ke program masternya di Hull University, England dengan jurusan Fish Marketing. Kemudian pada tahun 1985 hingga 1996, beliau menjadi Direktur Jenderal Perikanan di Kementerian Pertanian. Kemudian pada tahun 1996 hingga 2014 menjadi Trade Promotion Officer di InfoFish Malaysia. Dan yang terakhir pada tahun 2014 hingga sekarang menjadi Chief Technical Advisor di Unido Smart Fish Indonesia Program. Baiklah Pak Sudari, apakah sudah bergabung bersama kita di siang hari ini? Ya, siap. Terima kasih. Baik Pak Sudari. Untuk sesi selanjutnya dipersilahkan kepada Pak Sudari. Oke, okay, thank you. Thanks for generous introduction ya. Just for correction, I was not the general, director general ya. So it's, uh, <coughs> I was uh, working with the uh, Director General of uh, Fisheries uh, from 86 to 96. Thank you very much, Balaras. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, <coughs> Bapak Ibu sekalian, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Uh, to our Bukatuh. colleague uh, from uh, our distinguished speakers, good uh, afternoon. Our speaker from Australia, Dr. Regan Crook, and also Dr. Rob Kenley, I notice he's there also. And also, good morning for Pak Stefan Kran. Good morning, Pak. Sorry for waking you up very early today. <laughs> and then, good uh, good morning also, good evening for Steve, Dr. Steve Miller, yeah, from USA. So, uh, <clears throat> and then also, uh, distinguish all the participants. Thank you for joining us today. I think uh, today we have a very special webinar. We are going to, to uh, discuss about the potential development of, of uh, asparagopsis seaweed for sustainable livestock feed production to reduce methane. But first of all, before we start, I would like to thank to Ibu Artati, BTRT, the DG of uh, Product Competitiveness of the MMF for opening the webinar and also thanks to our colleague from uh, the ministry for the collaboration and also to <coughs> our event organizer Minapoli and also thanks to all the participants for joining us today. Uh, today we have a very uh, special webinar as I mentioned. First, I think this is, uh, this is the first webinar or the first uh, international webinar that we are, we are organized here in Indonesia, uh, discussing about asparagopsis. Yeah. That is as far as I know. So this is very special. The second, why this is very special? Because we have uh, we are going to talk about the future. Yeah. yeah we, are, we are talking about the climate change, but the global warming, actually we are talking about our future. Recently, I, I, I attended a webinar, international webinar, and then on environment. And uh, the highlight is that uh, they said that uh, there are now, uh, uh, there are three crises in the world currently. The first crisis is climate change. The second crisis is pollution. And the third crisis is the uh, biodiversity loss. So this is three crises from the point of view of environment. 
So we are going to talk today related to climate change. That is, as in particular, the role of seaweed, the potential role of seaweed to contribute to reduce methane that uh, contributing to the global warming. So, uh, and then uh, we have a special special speakers also today from uh, three continent, different continents, from Australia, from Europe, and from USA. I think this is something special and then uh, and uh, this is unique no? because not many experts are available to talk about this topic. So we are lucky today that uh, we have a uh, uh, distinguished speaker from uh, Dr. Uh, from, uh, from, uh, from, from uh, people who really uh, has a hands-on experience on this uh, aspect. And then hopefully, hopefully Indonesia can learn and then also we can exploit uh, to explore our uh, potential on this area. Yeah, we know that Indonesia is uh, the largest, one of the largest producers of seaweed. But in the aspect of uh, asparagus, I think this is something new, something that's still in the uh, small scale research here and there. That's why we today we don't have a, a, a speaker from Indonesia, but we have a discussion yeah that will be will review the, the presentation with you right i think uh, without further ado i think we will uh, we would like to invite free speaker that will be uh, delivered by uh, that is from uh, australia that is a uh, dr regan crook that and also uh, dr rob kenley that will uh, present about asparagopsis species for reduction of methane emission red meat and dairy production potential and challenges so but before that i just like to uh, read uh, uh, dr regan uh, crook uh, brief bio that is uh, she is a phd in engineering from university of melbourne master of business administration australian graduate school of management bachelor of chemical engineering from Uni university of queensland and he is now is a CEO, Chief of Executive Officer of Future with Australia. This presentation is prepared, jointly prepared by Dr. Regan Crooks and also Dr. Rob Kendu. So please, your time, uh, Regan, 20 minutes for your presentation. Thank you. Um, thank you. Can I just um, ask that our chief scientist, Dr. Rob Kinley, he will present the science. So if the presentation could be um, could be shown and then Dr. Rob Kinley will, will talk us through that presentation and I'll, I'll give some concluding remarks. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Please, uh, Dr. Rob Kinley, time is yours now. Oh, hello. Listen, really excited to, uh, to have been invited to join you. Uh, talking about my favorite subject, of course. This is uh, a wonderful opportunity and in this respected uh, webinar is something very much would allow to, uh, to allow me to have an opportunity. So do we have a presentation on screen now? Yeah. Okay, I'm not seeing that. So I'll follow on my own. Okay, um, the first slide is the title slide. So we're talking about the hang on, hang impact on, that- Clara, uh, can you share the screen, please? There is, there is no, no presentation yet, Rob. So you either have to share or the organizers have to upload it for you. Would you like can, to share yourself to share. or would you like uh, our organizer to share it for you? No, I'll, I'll try and share right now. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. You have yes, it? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I'm just going to move it over in front of where I can see. Okay. So what I'm going to speak to you today in the first section here is, is about how this yeah. wonderful sorry, scene. Sorry, Rob. Same thing. We, we can't see it. Oh, you, <laughs> yeah, you, you, moved, it you moved it out of the screen. Oh, I, I, okay. <laughs> sorry. Better. I'm just I'm just a scientist. We don't have that much common knowledge around technology. <laughs> Normal. Put, put no. on your slide so please. Yeah, slide so. <laughs> I'll just be looking a little to the side as I follow these. Okay. okay so, right. so um, yes, of course, asparagopsis is this very exciting seaweed 
um, has come to light in, in over the last decade with, with its extremely powerful capability when fed to, to ruminant livestock. And so I'm just going to take you through a little bit on, on how, that, uh, how that came to be. So I'm, I'll open the, uh, the conversation with you. Uh, so yes, I'm Dr. Rob Kinley. I'm chief scientist and one of the founders of this concept of this particular seaweed through a number of phases. And Dr. Reagan Crooks is our chief executive officer and she'll join me a little bit later in, in the uh, presentation. So we've taken a number of approaches through testing initially in vitro. So the laboratory work was very highly successful. So because of that level of success, we, we've got a little bit of a boost that said, okay, we've got to move very quickly on this um, in the current um, state of affairs. So we tried it in sheep first in, in a very quick, very quick proof of concept study and, and the results were outstanding. So from then it, there it evolved very quickly into testing in, in cattle. And just before I get there, you, you may have seen this slide before, it's certainly not mine. Uh, it, it's, it stays a lot though in, in a small little bar graph. Uh, the level of um, greenhouse gas emissions as carbon, carbon dioxide equivalents, if cattle were a country, they would rank third in the world in terms of emitters. So that in itself is, is an incentive to try and do something where we can. And, and emissions from cattle is something that we can manage uh, as you've been hearing and as I'm going to describe to you. But we're not alone in this effort. There, there are a number of aspects and uh, different types of approaches um, in terms of feed control. So of course, there's a lot of issues around animal and livestock management that happens outside of the animal that, that can certainly reduce emissions. But when, when you start dealing with the feed itself, then there's a number of ways by improving pasture quality, by putting, um, for instance, legumes like Desmanthus and Lucana into the pastures, where the animals can reach those, particularly at those times of the year where the forage quality falls. So in this sense, it's very helpful both directly in emissions reduction, but also in emissions intensity so that the animals continue to be productive instead of reaching a point in their seasonal um, production where they actually lose productivity. There's a couple of really forefront products now that are approaching market in, in, in their commercialization efforts. So 3-Niproxy propanol is a chemical, a synthetic chemical that has a capability that we're seeing somewhere up to about 30% in, in reported um, studies so far. That's good, of course it's good. Um, 10 years ago, that would be considered to be uh, top shelf. But now with this red seaweed, 30% is considered um, a low number relative to what we can produce with the seaweed. So at 80% reduction on average, and we have peaked out around 98%, in feedlot diets, and I'll get a little bit more into what the diet matrix means in, in a couple of minutes. But this red seaweed asparagopsis is an outstanding feature for livestock, and, and it's the production of that that will bring us uh, into the future. So the first major breakthrough in cattle happened here where I'm sitting in Townsville, Australia in Queensland, where we did a feedlot simulation. So we use that high grain diet that's typical of feedlots. And when I say high grain, I mean the diet consisted of close to 90% barley, steamrolled barley. 
and that in itself is a, a, a reduced methane emission from that uh, particular type of diet, but it's also a diet that's sensitive to being able to be further reduced and the seaweed capitalizes on that very well. So these bar graphs left to right. So the first one is a clear staircase downward um, trajectory with increasing levels of the seaweed. Now those levels are very low. On a, on a dry matter percentage, you're talking about that little tiny red dot at the bottom is about 0.3 to 0.4 percent of dietary intake in dry matter, and that's that little red dot represents 98 percent reduction in in methane emissions. The yellow bar is half of that in terms of inclusion level. So that small amount from 0.2 percent of dry matter intake to 0.4 percent initiated from a roughly 40% reduction to 98% reduction. So that very small additive is very important. But just as important is the impact that it has on the animal's digestion process. So in the middle bar graph, you can see that there's very little effect on digestibility. And, and that's, that is the game changer. If you can get that kind of emission reduction without any impact on the digestion of feed and potentially an improved digestion of feed, then you are really headed in the right direction towards having the industry adopt it as, as a mainstream technology for emissions reduction. Now, we've been seeing, if you look on the far right graphic, we've been seeing differences amongst the, between trials in how effective it is in energy redistribution. So methane emissions represent up to 15% of feed energy consumed. So as you can see in that third graphic, third bar chart there, there is a suggested improvement in productivity in term, uh, uh, manifested as daily weight gain. That's really important when you're paying for feed to be able to turn it around into weight gains without having to increase your amount of dietary intake. That in itself is, is a very important issue for adoption. But right now it's, I would call it a noisy number in that it varies quite a bit from trial to trial. So very large animal trials are required to be able to pin down just what that improvement is and how it will manifest. So that, was the initiation towards doing it in a similar format, but using a different, slightly different diet in a different region. So in California, in the USA, the trial was done again, but it was done in a different format. Instead of just using the feedlot finishing period, it was done using the starter diet across the transition diet and then into the feedlot finishing period. And we reported 150 days on feed with this one. So that was the longest day on feed. And I'll, I'll explain to you the importance of that. So the methane reduction in itself is once again, a relatively clear stairway uh, down in, in emission reduction. So if you look at the first phase there, the starter, that's, that's when the animals, will, animals were introduced to the seaweed and the impact of it was very strong, but it wasn't as much as you might expect from the finishing diet. So that's just indicating to us how the, uh, the diet matrix or the diet formulation is affected um, or affects the effectiveness of the seaweed itself. So the, the amount of seaweed in the diet on a per kilogram basis didn't change as you went across this graphic. So it stayed at, at those 0.25 and 0.5 or 0.5 and 1% of dry weight. So it's a little bit more than what was, what was described in the previous study. But 
a very important feature here, and I'm going to use my pointer, is the difference between the purple bar and the blue bar changes as the diet changes. So when we got to the high grain diet, there's almost no difference between the purple and the blue bars. Mm -hmm. What that is saying is that the seaweed is that much more effective in, in the diet uh, of a high grain feedlot diet. So we just need to do a little more R&D, a little more research to figure out how to close these gaps or where we need to bring the level of dietary intake up to to achieve more than 80% reduction. We know we can do it, but we just need to be able to, uh, to get that amount of seaweed into the animals Hello. or 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 improve the level you, of Wendy. sorry can you hear me now yeah i'm sorry i'm not sure what happened there um yeah, I think so that's what we need you, you second <laughs> okay so uh, I mean, just before i finish this slide the basis is that we just need to develop the technology and knowledge around delivering uh, the seaweed into the grazing systems where the forage level is higher and get it there in the appropriate appropriate levels. And that is by either more seaweed or higher quality seaweed, which um, there are some other speakers that will probably come to that. So what that translated into is that there was an improvement in the cost of production. So the feed, the feed use efficiency was improved when methane was reduced. So once again, that energy could be redistributed, or it was shown to, but in a slightly different way than in the first study I described. So what we have here is over 150 days, we have about an average of 50 cents per kilo of feed savings. When, when feeding the seaweed. So if this, if this was a feedlot feeding 1,000 head of cattle for 180 days, the mathematics on that is 90,000 US dollars saving over 1,000 head. If you just look at the finishing period, then the savings translates into at 25 cents, a uh, difference of 25 cents per kilo in feed costs, that translates into about $23,000 savings on a thousand head over 90 days. So I'm not gonna talk much here because this will be left to the, to the other speakers, but what we're dealing with in terms of supply of the seaweed, there's three formats that we're getting it. Right now we're commonly using the wild harvest because the, uh, the cultivation systems are in development, but they're coming on rapidly which means that the wild harvest will fall, fall off in terms of quantity supply very quickly. And then there will be the land-based culture and tanks and then the ocean-based farming systems that will provide the bulk of, of seaweed for the large systems. So um, one of my last slides here is that in terms of the bioactive in the seaweed, which will quantify by bromoform is that as, as you change the diet matrix, you need a little more of the bioactive to, to get a high level of emission reduction up close to 80%. So the very high dots up here, that's that feedlot study where we get 98% reduction. And we did so on a very low around 0.2% of um, organic matter intake or half a percent of dry matter intake uh, at a seaweed, uh, a good quality seaweed. But as the, as the level of grass has increased, there you see the bend, the bend in that uh, average curve um, slowing down the emission reduction so we can bring it back up by increasing the level or the quality of the seaweed. So um, before I pass it over to Reagan, um, this, this is one of my favorite slides or my favorite comments where uh, 
the point is that uh, the seaweed isn't just good for animals. It's, it's good for the climate and it's good for the environment in a number of different ways. And uh, it, it can create economies where other economies such as fisheries are, are struggling or even collapsed. It can create new economies in regional areas where um, economies are, are desired. Uh, and, and then it can be, or while the seaweed is being cultivated, it's cleaning the water where it's growing. So it, it can go hand in hand with um, other types of aquaculture like fin fisheries or, or an outflow of other high nutrient industries where the seaweed can use that to help its, help its um, production levels. And then it's consuming CO2, so reducing ocean acidity and then fed to cattle reduces dramatically reduces the greenhouse gas emissions and therefore the contribution of agriculture red meat and dairy production uh, to the global inventories and can also or is indicated at least to pro to provide a pretty decent improvement in feed use efficiency so with that um, i'll just pass it over to reagan to to complete the presentation Thanks, Rob. Um, hello, everyone. I just want to give a quick overview of how we're um, delivering this fantastic technology in terms of its commercialization. Um, Future Feed's role is in licensing the technology to the seaweed growers. So Stefan and, and Steve will be talking as seaweed growers um, who will be supplying seaweed. Um, they're licensed seaweed growers. And as licensed seaweed growers, then um, they can sell that seaweed to livestock producers because it's a patented technology. So everything that Rob was talking about is under a patent. The other thing that Future Feed does, most of our time is spent in animal trials, as you would have seen. Um, Rob leads a team of animal scientists running animal trials. Those trials are critical. They support our regulatory dossiers and they provide um, data for our industry to show to demonstrate the productivity gains and the methane reductions. Um, we also have a certification system. We have, what that means is we have a certification trademark that is being launched in the coming months. That certification trademark will give consumers of meat and wool and milk confidence in the methane reduction. Uh, and lastly, of course, marketing is very important for us, future feed spends um, a significant investment in marketing of the technology and uh, informing the industry of our trials and, and what's coming in the future. Next slide, please, Rob. As Rob spoke to, we, um, we believe in building a closed loop system. So what that means is that the asparagopsis that is grown in a region is fed to cattle in that or livestock in that region and the carbon abatement is realized in that region. Um, so it all stays within a region, which is different to other methane inhibitors um, where they could be produced in another country and then imported. By having everything in one region, the carbon footprint is reduced as well. Thanks, Rob. Collaboration is something that's key to our industry. We, have a we are building a, a, basically building an industry. We're building a value chain all the way from the seaweed growers, the feed formulators, all the way through to our livestock producers. We need to collaborate to realize the impact this technology can have. The impacts are significant, as you heard from Rob, over 80% reduction in methane, and we can bring that into commercial reality by collaborating. So Future Feed plays a big role in ensuring that collaboration across our industry. Next, thanks, Rob. Next, Rob. Uh, and the final message from us, as you would have heard from Rob as well, is that future feed technology is good for animals. Um, so we, we, there are no impacts on, on the animals, no adverse impacts. It's good for the animals. In fact, it leads to gains in weight. It's good for climate change because we get a large reduction in that methane and it's good for business. Uh, so I'll leave you with that message and look forward to hearing from our seaweed growers. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rickon Crook and Dr. Rob Kenley. I think very, uh, very good presentation. I think I like that uh, the last slide. Yeah, that is uh, the seaweed is good for feed for the animal. 
good for the environment, climate, and so good for the business. I think I fully agree with that. And then the important there is also opportunity for collaboration with, with, with uh, our stakeholders here in Indonesia yeah, for the future. Thank you very much. Uh, then I would like to tell you to stay and then probably for question and answer we can uh, have later on. But now uh, we the, the next uh, <clears throat> presentation is uh, from Dr. Uh, from uh, Stephen Crown, PhD. He's a chief uh, science, scientific officer of the seaweed company in Ireland. Uh, he he will uh, uh, make a presentation on uh, on asparagopsis uh, sorry the mass cultivation of asparagopsis species a possible solution for sustainable feed production that mitigates uh, methane emission so this is i think very important topics because uh, i think the uh, production of asparagopsis particularly for farming i think this is relatively very new and then probably if we can uh, do it here in indonesia that will be a uh, Oh, wonderful, yeah. So, uh, uh, I'd like to invite uh, Stefan Kran PST, Dr. Stefan Kran, to uh, give his presentation. So, time is yours, Dr. Kran, for 20 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Pastor Dari. Um, I shall start sharing. There we go. Can you all see this? Can you see this? Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. yeah. Then, then I'll start. Uh, well, thank you very much for the introduction, uh, Pasudari. And uh, indeed, I will talk a bit more about the cultivation. We just heard the whole story about why it's so interesting to use this seaweed. I will focus a little bit more on how to grow it and uh, what we can do with that. First, a little bit on who we are, the seaweed company. We are more a uh, company that looks at seaweed from a social, ecological, and then also thirdly on an economical uh, viable aspect. Uh, we are an inter horizontal integrated or vertical integrated, how you look upon it, uh, company that does the biomass cultivation all the way up to uh, developing the products. And that can be from biofertilizer, food, feed, pharma, uh, bioplastics, uh, biomaterials. And how do we do that? By combining and finding the right people with the right backgrounds in, in the different areas. Uh, currently, we have four operations going, one where I live here in Ireland, one in Morocco, one in the Netherlands, and one in India, where we cultivate and grow different types of seaweed. And in our uh, marketing basically concept, we basically run two uh, concepts. One is called blue farming, and that is really for the animal and agriculture sectors by using seaweeds. The other one is called Blue Health, where we specifically gear into the effects of seaweeds on human health. Um, in, in a nutshell, you see those two concepts here, uh, where we combine all these skill sets together to make these products to have an impact in blue farming and in blue health. Now, the asporopsis itself, why is this so interesting? And the question is very simple because of the secondary metabolites. And these are the bromoforms or the halogenated compounds because brome is not the only compound in Asparagopsis, but we come back to that later on. Uh, but it is these type of compounds that has uh, spiked the interest in the species because of the effects on uh, methane producing bacteria in the rumen in, in cattle. Um, let me reduce this. So th this is the story that Rob was just talking about, uh, what all happens in the cow. I'm not going into that, but believe me, there is methane coming out uh, from the back and from the front. A lot of numbers have been published, uh, some exaggerated, some uh, spot on, some underestimated. But more or less, this, this is the story. It is much stronger than CO2, methane, as a greenhouse gas. And you're talking about... 15% of all greenhouse gas produced is attributed to livestock. And of that livestock, because that can be sheep, that can be a llama, that can be cows, of that livestock, 65% is from the beef and dairy industry. If you look uh, back to a little bit of the, the history, uh, the first thing, or the first time I heard this, was at the ISAP conference in Australia, in Sydney, um, in 2014 where they showed the in vitro experiments at the time uh, with already very good reductions, more than 90%. Uh, 
uh, then it of course, and Rob was explaining that a little bit as well, uh, depends on the feed uh, intake, what type of feed is fed, but also on the genetics, the breed, the climate, where it's taking place, etc. But still, they get better, much better numbers than uh, free knobs. The bromoform compounds have been researched for a very long time, actually, already in the 70s, they were on to this, that this has a very anti or strong antibacterial working. And the application of Asparagopsis solely for ruminants now that is patented indeed for uh, the last, well, I don't know, six years, but Regan can tell exactly when that was. Uh, but the use of seaweeds, of course, have been used for over several hundreds of years for, for cattle, for health and well-being. Now, several species have been identified uh, with potential to reduce uh, methane emissions, and Asparagopsis is one, but there's also other species like Alaria or Ascophyllum or Chondrus that also have the same effect. Now, preliminary tests with an overdoses of this species have also been uh, taken place in the, in the Netherlands, actually, by Wouter Muiselaar. He was actually our fourth speaker, but I think he, he is not here today. But he showed that if you really go up in high levels, uh, 67 grams per cow per day, up to 333 grams per cow per day, then it's not all rosy. And there are some problems with transfer of brom bromoform compounds uh, into the meat and in the milk. And there is also inflammation of the rumen lining, uh, which is kind of strange because this seaweed is also eaten as a delicacy, for example, in Hawaii. Now, bromoform is one, but there is a, another problem that we have with Asparagopsis, and that is iodine. And iodine can be really high. Uh, it's been studied in several papers, and you're talking about 5,000 to 15,000 ppm. So that's parts per million. Um, for that reason, here in Europe at least, it's not approved yet for commercial inclusion, uh, and this is the European uh, Food and Feed Safety Authority other than in research trials. Now, a lot of lobby groups are working on this and trying to change this, but there is issues with, with the bromoform. And now there is a lot of uh, pressure coming from certain groups that uh, we follow the same path as zinc oxide that was uh, taking place in swine farming as, as a growth promoter uh, instead of antibiotics, but all that zinc is now ending up in the land and has an effect on protozoa and, and bottom flora in, in, in the soil. So Asparagopsis at the moment uh, as inclusion of feed material in the market, that is still, well, the jury is still out. And uh, that bottom slogan there in yellow is the latest or not the latest, but that is a statement from 2019 from the committee in the EU, and they will come back on this issue. Well, you know yourself with uh, the political level, it can take quite a few years before we get to a conclusion. Now, if you look at Ireland, we already were cultivating this species in the 90s. Now, at the time, it was used for the antibacterial working, and it was used for or by a cosmetics company. And it was the, the sulfated polysaccharides with the different iodine and bromine groups, and that were basically used as a preservative in natural produced cosmetics. We were cultivating this in, in small plots, uh, two hectare, four hectare farms, uh, 14 kilometers of cultivation rope, facing rope, and per year there was produced about six to eight tons wet. And Asparagopsis contains a lot of water, so once it's dried out, uh, you're talking about six to 700 kilos of dry material. Why Asparagopsis armata? Well, point one, we don't have toxophobia uh, volume here in, in, in Ireland. Um, the farm design was very simple, and we know the market was already there. And it was the cosmetics uh, company at the time. Uh, primary processing was simple as well. They just harvested it and they froze everything and then sent it off. The species have been around here in Ireland since uh, before the Second World War, and the pilot production at the time was producing eight tons. And I was involved in this whole process at the time. So that was the, the kind of knowledge or the advantage we had. If we want to cultivate this in, in large scale, there's different ways. Uh, one is clonal propagation uh, and finding the optimums there to get uh, the maximum growth. Then another way to do this is through tissue culture and optimizing conditions. And finally, we have spore production. So getting the carpospores to release the, the carpogonium to release the carpospores 
and then go via the tetraspore the tetraspores, and then back into gametophytes. And that life cycle of Asparagopsis you can see here on the left. The gametophyte is actually the, the plant as we know it, but there is also a phase that is like a fluffy ball or pompon, and that is the tetrasporophyte phase, and it alternates. So we have been growing this in, in the lab and in tanks uh, outdoors a couple of years ago already, and we slowly start to unravel the life cycle here, how to produce uh, tetraspores from tetrasporophytes that you see here on the spool, growing back into, uh, in this bottom picture, for example, back into gametophytes. And this can all be, uh, the, the tetrasporophytes can all be cloned and grown in large scale. And then you can start to develop a system to start seeding. Now, we have been doing that for the last year, actually, here in Ireland, with uh, moderate success, where we sometimes had good growth, sometimes poorer growth. But this is all still in development, and it, it's starting to happen. So that's on the asparagopsis growth. And if you look at the quantities being grown, you're talking about uh, a kilo wet weight per meter. If you're lucky, uh, if you're not so lucky, a few hundred grams. So it, it is at the moment still optimizing, further developing and trying to automate the whole seeding and, and harvesting systems. Now, that is something uh, from the background we do with other species that we already have developed quite far. Um, but what I said, there is still some issues at uh, the scalability. And uh, I'm talking about licensing and not licensing for a patent, but licensing from the government to actually get the areas to grow this stuff, which is still a bit of a problem. Uh, the other way is how to preserve the asparagopsis, because studies came out from uh, Professor Yarish in the States that if you just dry this and store this, after four months, your active ingredient has evaporated. So then it can be used anymore. And this is one of the reasons why at the moment for all the trials and most work, they either freeze dry or they preserve it in oil. Then we still have the issue with iodine that uh, might throw a spanner in the works, at least here in Europe, but we'll see how that develops because we need the EFSA approval and the legislation behind it that we can safely use this in feed. And then there is the, the question about animal welfare and well-being because of the inflammation that it might cause at higher levels or in different types of diet in, in cows. So it's not all yet solved. The question then is, can we reduce methane in, in a profitable way? Well, we, we probably can, but uh, we need a very low inclusion rate and a combination of different things. Eh? The, not only the uh, bromoforms can reduce methane, there's other ingredients in seaweeds, like the polyphenols that also play a role. And sometimes there's ingredients that not only work of, of not work on the methane forming bacteria, but on the protozoa or other rumen uh, kind of species that are in there and help with the digestion. So it might be a multifaceted approach. The preferred uh, way is to, when you start using it, that you also enhance the performance of the cow. And uh, that has already been demonstrated that that is the case. Um, we have done trials ourselves well, of course, and we show with the, the feed conversion ratios that there is a, a, an improvement. Um, but most importantly, and this is of course, at the moment, Asparagopsis is still very expensive to produce, but that can be lowered not by only a better feed conversion ratio and reduce the price of the feed intake, but more so, I would say, if we look from a carbon point of view. And if we, with the seaweed growing, take up the CO2, then that there is a price that should be paid for doing this kind of stuff. And that is where I think we can make the whole operation uh, profitable for everybody involved. So with everybody involved, I mean really everybody involved, which goes from farmer, where we look at animal productivity, health and welfare uh, benefits, and that should become part of the solution. Then we look at the dairy and beef industry. So we have an emissions reduction um, that, that helps that industry. The consumer itself, they get a climate friendly choice uh, of, of meat that they can use and still love to eat the beef if they want to. The governments, of course, play a role there. 
and that is to, to meet basically the, the greenhouse uh, reduction targets. Um, and at the moment, that is a big problem because none of them are actually close in achieving that. And also even in the non-food industry, they can actually invest and help the, the farmers and the growers to offset their own carbon footprint by allowing to grow these type of seeds. So we call them cow credits, but you can name it whatever you want. So to put in perspective, and, and this is also a very nice discussion I sometimes have. If you look at the feasibility, the feasibility of this uh, deploying on large scale. So how much seaweed do we have to grow to, to make a dent in this? Well, Ireland has about one and a half million dairy cows. And these dairy cows, milking cows, basically eat about 25 kilos dry matter a day. And if we assume, uh, Rob was talking about half percent, uh, 0 0.2 and 0.4 percent, but let's say 0.1 percent of the dry matter intake has to be asparagoxus. Then you can do the quick calculation and you get to a certain amount of tons, 13,687 metric tons of algae. But that is dry weight. So you have to multiply it by another 10 to get the wet weight. And we use systems in the past that were not optimized yet. The lines were very spaced and, well, we were still discovering this. But let's say that you can produce about 10 tons wet weight per hectare. Then you need about 14,000 hectares or 14 square kilometers. Now, this sounds big, but it isn't, and I'll show you. If you look, for example, here at the Philippines, and this is about uh, Capophycus cultivation, um, you see all these in the left, left picture, all these little dark shades, and they're all little small seaweed plots. And for reference, you see a little boat there in the middle of the picture, and that is bo bottom line cultivation. But the amount that is taken there for bottom line cultivation is enormous. That is already the scale of about 10 square meter that you just see in that picture. That is in the Philippines. Picture at the bottom is just a bay somewhere in Korea. And again, you see kind of a bit of a dark uh, shape at the bottom there, little square, well, little small squares. And if you zoom into that, and you can all find this on Google Maps, by the way, very easy to, uh, to figure out. They're all, again, small seaweed plots. In this case, it's kelp growing at the surface. But it just shows you the, the, the scale of where seaweed cultivation is already taking place in Asia. So that scale can be done. Now, if we look at Ireland, uh, Ireland on, on, on the right there, and the, the area where I live, that's in the red box in Galway. And what you see there is Galway Bay. And if we enlarge that on the left, there you see 14 square kilometer uh, laid out in that bay. And that is what it more or less take to treat the whole dairy herd in Ireland with about 25 grams or 20 grams of asporogopsis a day. Now, normally you wouldn't put it in like a massive scale like that in one bay, you spread it out over the whole coastline. And in the bottom, you see, for example, the different uh, bays and areas where this all could take place. And then you're talking about much smaller farms. So this is something that I think can easily be done. It is now becoming more a political play where governments have to decide, will they want to reach their targets? How they're going to do that? Because this also for Ireland, for example, will bring uh, new avenues for job employment, uh, production. And that is a, a big benefit on top of the benefits that they can achieve by using the asporogopsis in uh, dairy. And that is where I would like to leave my story. Thank you very much for your attention and enjoy the rest of the, the webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Pa Stefan Kran. So I call you Pa also, yeah, because uh, yep. you're familiar. <laughs> Thank you very much. Very good uh, presentation. I think we have a kind of uh, uh, can figure out uh, how we how, how much we need the uh, area if we want to uh, to cultivate the uh, asparagopsis to replace only for Point something percent of the feet. Yeah? I think this is a uh, that we can we can imagine how how how, how big the area it is. But uh, uh, <clears throat> this is very good. And uh, just a few notes that uh, in it uh, uh, beside this uh, the potential of the uh, asparagopsis uh, as a feed uh, to reduce uh, methane, but there is also some challenges. Uh, I found this there is a in Europe still issues of uh, iodine. That the reason uh, that the regulator not yet approved this uh, the use of uh, asparagus as a 
supplement for the feet. And also there is an issue of the scalability. And of course, uh, uh, also technology of the farming. I think this is something that uh, uh, <coughs> probably with collaboration, with the research, probably the future that can be, uh, can be overcome. Thank you, Ba Stefan. And uh, now the, uh, the last but not least uh, presentation is from uh, Dr. <coughs> Dr. Steve Miller, PhD. The, he is a Chief Executive Officer of CH4 Global Incorporate, Incorporate from US. So Dr. Uh, Steve Miller is uh, he is uh, he has a education background, PhD in uh, neuroscience, University of Adelaide, and bachelor degree in uh, neuropsychology, University of Adelaide also. And uh, he has a <clears throat> professional experience uh, as a chief business officer at the CS4 Global Inc. And then uh, from 2016, up to the present, he is the advisory board member of Logic Co. And then in 2013, he was the co-founder and chairman at WIS Who World. So welcome, uh, Dr. Steve Miller. And then uh, without further ado, I give you 20 minutes for your presentation, please. Great, thank you. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen. Yes, yes, you can. I will try again. It seemed to not let me. Here we go. Thank you very much. So I, uh, I changed a few slides around based on what everyone else was talking a little bit, because I know you had me down to talk about the challenges of bromoform present preservation and, uh, and um, hatchery development, but I'm gonna do it more, much more broadly than that and talk about those within here. So can you all see my, uh, my slides there? Yes. Great. So we are, as Regan said at the outset, we are a commercialization company. Our goal is to grow large amounts of seaweed as, as uh, Stefan has just talked and commercialize it um, with urgency. And the urgency is really focused on the climate change challenges in which we have as a human species on this planet, which I'll happily talk in more detail. So I wanna share with you what that journey looks like for us and some of the challenges that have been talked about today and how we're dealing with those. So I'm going to give you some different perspectives and slightly different numbers than what both Rob and Stefan have. Here's the problem we have today in the world leading up to COP26 in the first week of November. All of the agreements that every country on the planet made in Paris do not, period, get us to a two degree centigrade warming planet. That's not possible to do that. If the world met those commitments made in Paris in 2015, we're on a path to 3.2 degrees centigrade warming by the year 2100. In fact, the United Nations publishes every single year what they call the emissions gap report in December. And in December's report of last year put out by the Secretary General, it tells you very, very clearly in the report what is the gap if we met the Paris goals and where the world needs to be in terms of greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 in order to be on two degrees, and that gap is 13 gigatons. So if the world met its commitments, we're still 13 gigatons short. And in fact, last week, the week before last, sorry, now I, I apologize, the United Nations put out a report and said, instead of being on a pathway to a 45% reduction in greenhouse gases, Based on the commitments that have come in already leading up to COP26 in Scotland here in a, in a bit more than a month's time, the world is on task for a 16% increase in greenhouse gases in 2030. It's a bad, bad situation. So United Nations also, both in the IPC6 report here a couple of months ago and the month before that, 
issued uh, parts of their summaries in here. And this is a quote from the executive director of the UNEP that cutting emissions is the strongest lever we have to slow climate change over the next 25 years. And there's two reasons for that. One, it's a quote unquote short lived gas and it's around in the atmosphere for 12.4 years before it's broken down to funnily enough, carbon dioxide and water vapor. Um, but most importantly, the recognition that the decarbonization technologies people are working on today, solar, wind, uh, electric vehicles, battery storage, carbon capture and storage, none of those can scale sufficiently by 2030 to get anywhere near the carbon reductions that we need in greenhouse gas emissions. Methane is it. And as we all know, there are really two main sources of anthropogenic methane, oil and gas industry and agriculture. And within agriculture, as Stefan said, the large majority of that is cows ruminants burping. In fact, agriculture is larger than all of the um, fossil fuel emissions from methane. So it's the biggest one we have. And in fact, it's this big. It's not, as Rob put, five gigatons, it's 12.9 gigatons. And the reason that difference is there is a fundamental way in which you account for it. For the last four decades, the world has said that methane is more impactful than carbon dioxide over a 100 year period of time. In fact, that number is 34 times now in the most recent report. It used to be 28, it used to be 25, and it used to be 18. And it's changed over the number of years of reports. However, you can also measure methane's impact over a 20 year period, so called GWP20. That number is 86. We have nine years left to get to a 2030 goal. 86 is the number we use. I've had personally had the discussion with four different members of the United Nations, the uh, IPCC sixth report, and they all agree that there is no scientific basis. I repeat, no scientific basis for selecting GWP 100. It was done as a matter of convenience so that people didn't focus on short-term gases and focused on CO2. So the correct number to use is 86 times more impactful than carbon dioxide because that is the measure over a 20 year period of that which we have. So it's 12.9 gigatons. It is larger than the entire country of China at 11.7. It's larger than the United States, the number two emission emitter, the EU, the number three, and India, the number four put together. So that's, that's the problem we have to challenge with. Now, again, I'll go over a few things. The question you ask is, can you do anything about that ruminant methane emissions? And I'll present info, info to you in a slightly different way. Do they work? Are they safe? Are they scalable? These are the issues the world needs to understand. And if you look across here, there's about 10 different ways that people are looking at, have looked at, are currently looking at as it relates to methane emissions in ruminants. And you'll see them across other seaweeds, mostly uh, grasses, breeding programs, vaccines, devices, the whole hammock, gamut of them. And in general, they're all 30% or less. Some of them five to 10%. Asparagopsis, at least with good quality asparagopsis, that which is above six milligram per gram dry weight, um, generally comes out in the 90 to 80 to five to 90 plus percent range in here. So the question that we're all wrestling with is, how do you grow it at scale? What does that look like? In fact, I'll, I'll go further on Stefan's one that he talked about the case for Ireland. If you calculate across those 1.5 billion cows on the planet and you say, how much do we need to grow? And you went to an atlas and you opened it up to the Pacific and you drew a circle around the islands of Fiji. That is the gross square area that we need to do, somewhere around 25 to 28,000 square kilometers on the planet. So you look at it in the scale of the size of the ocean, it's not very big at all. So let's talk about how do we get there. There's three key questions that get you to commercial scale. Can you grow it? Stefan talked in a number of different ways about the work that they've been doing, and I'll share some information. Can we process it? And today, under the licenses from FutureFeed, freeze drying, and that is a large scale freeze drying piece of equipment that about 10 of us could get inside of that piece of equipment for scale, 
um, the door is larger than the height of most people, um, we want one must freeze dry it. And so you need to understand the freeze drying process whose sole goal it is, is to remove water and preserve bromoform and the other halogenated materials in there. And then importantly, and as Stefan said, can you sell it? So I'm gonna share a few things about that. Um, the first we have to do is understand what is the end-to-end -end process? How do you understand the processes that may go in in a hatchery that allow you to propagate the species uh, and leverage the sexual reproductive cycle? How do you scale that in the ocean? And what does that look like? And or in tanks or other media? How do you process it? And then how do you freeze dry it? I just use some pictorial examples here. And I think the, the next one, let me go to here. Let's go to this one. This is the one that I really want to spend a little bit of time focusing on. This is the, the way I talk about it to folks. These are the four key boxes of end-to-end -end processing and the production. There is the development of a hatchery and a nursery. And in order to do that, as Stefan said, there are a number of different ways in which to propagate the species. Um, we actually have some work going on in all of those areas, as do other research groups in here. But in terms of spore release, uh, which is one of the ways, we, as Stefan has, we've had material growing in tanks through its life cycle six or seven different times, the same material propagating. Uh, but back in the early part of this year, we seem to have come across the ways in which we can consistently now trigger spore release, um, allowing us to very clearly manage the life cycle. So we've built um, a modest size hatchery now in New Zealand and in Australia, the two countries with which we currently have operations today. Um, and we're now transferring all of that material onto seeded ropes in here, which we'll be using in the near future for uh, uh, large scale propagation. So understanding that box is really a, a key piece in here. And then understanding what is the propagation rate or the growth rate of biomass that you have in those nurseries and tanks. When you have that, you need to grow it. Um, and you can grow it in at least three different ways. One is within the ocean on long lines, for which you can take from your seeded hatchery lines. Uh, we have about 10 kilometers of lines growing right now, both in Australia and New Zealand. It's a small amount. It's what we're using to optimize the growing conditions, understand them, and then optimize them. You can also grow them in tanks. Um, and there are a number of companies in this particular space that are looking to understand tank-based cultivation. It's more expensive simply because you have to pay for the nutrients, you have to pay for the light, and you have to pay for the physical land space. All of those come free when it's in the ocean. And then you can also grow it in ponds. Um, and in Australia in particular, there are large scale ponds left over from mining operations, mining and minerals, and also from shrimp farming and others that are land-based. And those ponds are assets which, with, with which we can leverage and utilize for lowering the overall cost of production. Then when you've grown it, you need to harvest it and process it. And as I said, that is partly where the key is. You can lose all of the bromoform content in that processing. Uh, Stefan said, you know, shared the information on a publication that says, hey, if you just leave it out for four months in here, that's exactly what will happen. Um, less so if you keep it in a cold chain and in a freezer. But the point is you need to both process it to ensure you retain the integrity of most of the bromoform that's in the native species that grew in the ocean or the tanks with which you produced. But then importantly, you need to formulate this. Um, and you need to formulate it for different target groups, a dairy cow, a beef cow, and a quote unquote free range cow, one that we don't see every day, have very different requirements for what you need to be able to do. A beef cow who is fed, feed all day long on a continuous basis, which is where most of the trials have been done, require that seaweed to then be able to be formulated and stabilized so that at room temperature through a supply chain over at least a six month period, it is eminently stable. So that's group one. Group two, 
from a dairy cow standpoint, they don't eat feed on a continuous basis. At best, we see them twice a day when they're milked. Their rumen is more empty in the morning. And so how do you deliver a single dose to a cow in the morning milking that will not empty from the rumen, that'll provide access to bromoform released from a formulation when methane is being produced and then do so sustainably over a 24 hour period. In a cow that you don't see every day, perhaps not even every week, now you need a completely different type of formulation. One in which if you could get to that cow every week, you could deliver a payload from a formulation standpoint that the stabilized seaweed is then able to deliver to that cow. So a payload that can actually be provided over at least a week period of time or a two week period of time. And you need to develop the methods in which you can get that payload to that cow on a weekly or a biweekly basis. All of those formulation pieces we've actually developed and we're validating them here over the next 12 months. Um, the same thing for each of those boxes on the hatchery and the cultivation progress in here. Um, we're, we're spending a lot of time and effort now optimizing all the tank based production um, modifying and optimizing the triggers for spore release, all of the methods that we're going to use for seeded lines. We already have New Zealand's largest seaweed farm under production now. From a, uh, from a processing standpoint, you can see some of the seaweed in here, but that piece of equipment on the bottom left, again, you can see for scale on here. Uh, when we build commercial scale facilities, there'll be three of those that will be running in parallel on processing the seaweed to get to about 400 dry tons uh, per commercial facility. But again, you need to understand the optimized conditions with which you process it, that you don't lose all the bromoform. We've lost all the bromoform at every single step. And we've spent two years studying and understanding how you do this, not only in the freeze drying process, but in the seven or eight steps before it and the two or three steps after it to get you to a finished product you need to be very careful at each of those steps to understanding it. So we're about, we're not a research company. We are a development and scaling company. So we have now from Future Feed, a license for Australia and New Zealand. It turns into a, a global license after three years, uh, but initially our target markets are in Australia and New Zealand. Um, there is regulatory approval there's regulatory agreement that the product today can be sold in both New Zealand and Australia, unlike Europe. Uh, we have a license. We're building the scale production. We already have now built and commissioned uh, three weeks ago what we call a market demonstration scale facility. It's designed to produce up to 10 tons of dried material in an annualized basis. Um, it's not designed to produce large scale material. It's designed to optimize the entire processing. And as you heard me talk about the formulation pieces of how you take a raw, a raw processed seaweed and turn it into the target products that actually give those cows what they need when they need it is one of the keys to commercial success. So as you heard me say, optimizing this work is the next 12 to 15 months. Uh, we've just raised $14 million US to do all of that work. And all of that work is going to continue over the next 12 months, ideally in here, um, so that we actually have the entire optimized uh, processing underway, leading us to this. We're doing all of the work in ocean. That's actually one of the shots of our New Zealand farm um, to understand bromoform content and biomass growth and the conditions in the ocean. We have ocean growth now in about six different locations. Um, the tank work that we're doing and the pond work that we're doing, again, to understand for each of those bromoform content, biomass growth, and the optimized conditions for them. We're also designing uh, now, a, 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 and in an engineering blueprint, a land-based facility that will contain the hatchery and nursery all of the processing and all of the product formulation facilities that engineering blueprint will have in 12 months or less than that now um, it can be built anywhere in the world it'll be the same everywhere in the world what will vary is the source of the seaweed 
whether it's coming from the ocean or tanks or ponds, using, as Regan said, and emphasized local strains. It's critically important that you do that and you use strains that are native to the region in which you are. Our goal, as I said, is to build those production scale facilities in Australia and New Zealand here over the next uh, 12 to 24 months and then everywhere in the world. And I'll come and share with you what that means. The first of those commercial scale facilities is going to be built in Australia and fully operational by the end of 2022. You can see on the right hand side where that target is. Um, somewhere, I think uh, Stefan had had 10, uh, uh, 10 tons per, uh, per hectare in here. We may be able to get closer to 15 uh, based on what we know at the moment. We've identified where those commercial sites will be and partners for them. Um, and we'll be start the process of building this commercial scale facility. In South Australia alone, we don't have the issue that Stefan has. Um, we already have a lease on 1,000 hectares of water space ourselves. There is 250,000 hectares of water space already approved by the South Australian government um, for aquaculture in size, so that can get to a very large capacity. I've done the calculations around Australia so wherever you grow seaweed in the ocean, any seaweed, but asparagopsis in particular, you need to make sure you, you, you adhere to four things. You do not grow it where it interferes with recreational fishing. You do not grow it in places where it interferes with tourism. Do not grow it in places where it interferes with other commercial operations. And you do not grow it in places where it interferes with um, transportation lines. When you do that, Australia is a great place to do it, frankly, because most of the continent is not habited. And I've done some rough calculations and said within Australia, where it is already approved to do, and it is simply a fishing license effectively to do so, and a relatively painless process, there is enough available, my calculations say there's enough available water space in Australia conservatively to provide enough product for 500 million cows. That's about a $400 billion industry, something to replace Australia's coal industry that it needs to stop. So when I talk about globally, you can see on this page in here, our initial site in South Australia, followed by New Zealand. Um, but we're already in discussions now in every colored region of the world with commercial scaling partners. So as we develop that global footprint, that blueprint of what it looks like and the capabilities and the knowledge about production rates and therefore cost of goods of product in each of the different systems, tank-based or modified tank-based ponds and ocean-based in here, we'll be able to very carefully predict um, what that cost and pricing will be. In the yellow box, we already have a commercial joint venture partnership with a Malaysian company now who is already growing other species. Um, and we're transferring the knowledge for all of the hatchery work right now so that he can start to scale local species, Malaysian. Um, and it's right next door to you uh, because it's, you know, it's on, the, on the, the top part of Borneo where all of that work's going on. Um, so where are we as a company and what do we focus on? And that's the commercial scale. So the licenses are in place. Regan had talked about those for us, for Australia and New Zealand, our initial markets. We already know there's a regulatory pathway in Australia and New Zealand today. Um, we're already creating all of the know-how around the hatchery and the processing and the intellectual property around the formulation work that's critical and key. We already have offtake agreements already now for $8 million and a lot of global corporates who are now in discussions with us for access to product and materials. And I don't mean farmers that grow it. I mean end users, large milk, meat processing, consumer product, dairy companies, et cetera. We believe we now have unlocked the life cycle management and resolved or resolving those issues with there. Um, and in where we grow it, it creates tremendous impact, both in terms of economic and social uh, impact in generally regional areas, in this case of South Australia. So great new jobs. Um, and um, we're engaged now in terms of the carbon credit organizational management of that side of things as well. So our job 
is to get product in market at scale as quickly as we can. And the world's first commercial scale facility should be built and operational before the end of next calendar year. That's me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Steve Miller. That's very interesting. And I think you have put all the puzzle together so we can see clearly the, the future of this uh, not very, very long. Maybe we will see the commercial of uh, fit using the red seaweed as part of I think that is what we already explained will be commercially in, in New Zealand and Australia. And then uh, our next door that Melissa also is uh, started to, to develop this and it's very interesting. Probably we would like to see also if uh, our stakeholders here also will be interested to, you know, to explore further, to collaborate with, uh, with uh, your company or with others. Yeah. Thank you very much, very interesting. Uh, now, uh, <clears throat> time to, uh, for discussion, but before that, I think we have a uh, uh, session for our reviewers, discussion. Then uh, for the next uh, 30 minutes or so, and we have two discussion here. First is uh, Dr. Uh, A.P. Susanto, MSc. He is, uh, he is a lecturer at uh, Diponegoro University in Semarang, Central Java. Dr. Susanto has a PhD in Marine Biotechnical University of Bremen, master degree in Marine Botanical from the University of Ryukyu, Japan. And then uh, uh, in, uh, professionally, he also uh, deputy director of Siamo in Bogor, that is uh, this Aradi Center in Bogor. And then in 2005, coordinator, coordinator of scholarship program in Ministry of Education. And he is very, uh, is, uh, one of the experts in Siwit Indonesia. So, and then the second discussion is, uh, like to, to introduce you is uh, Professor Dr. Uh, Laude M. Aslan, MSc. Uh, he is a professor at Halu Oleo University. He is a university in uh, Southeast uh, Sulawesi, yeah? Kendari. Uh, he got a Doctor of Science in Bi and Biology from the Tunku Tohoku University of uh, Sendai, Japan. Master degree in Biology from University of uh, Ryukyu, Okinawa, Japan and Bachelor in uh, Aquaculture from Parawijaya University, Malang, East Java. He is currently is a lecturer at the, at the university and uh, is experienced in innovative and sustainable seaweed farming, training in value chain improvement, upscaling of seaweed and for surface aspect of seaweed industry development, seaweed farming for small supply chain development. So uh, I'd like to invite uh, first, uh, uh, wait, uh, is it uh, Dr. Susanto first or Pa Aslan? Yeah, please. Pa Aslan first, probably, or Pa Susanto? It depends on you. Okay, Pa Susanto, please, your time. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, congratulations to Dr. Rekan Kroc and uh, Dr. Rob Kenley for the presentation. Today is very, very interesting to discuss or to heard about the asp asparagopsis. So it is nice to a uh, nice presentation from uh, Dr. Rob Kindley. It figure how is the exiting asparagopsis uh, red algae has been used in Australia to reduce methane gas production. Special uh, in uh, fifth slide, there are many possibility of the material or many possibility of the feed livestock, Romanian livestock that already used in Australian to reduce the uh, methane gas. In Indonesia, as also there are one possibility maybe to substitute the uh, species of the as as asparagopsis. There is uh, still in research, the student use sargassum. Eh, sargassum. The species also can grow in 
all of the water I found when I was in uh, Japan. And also I found also when I was in Herkulen Island in Germany. Yeah. But uh, the research, they, they, they make a powder for a good fit. Uh, not, not cow, but cow fit. But the, the, the research is not yet intensively, but this species has potential useful of this species. Maybe, uh, how is your uh, idea? How is your uh, opinion about this? And the second, uh, about the cultivation of asparagopsis, you explain there are three uh, possibility with harvest from the, the natural and then land cultivation and also ocean cultivation. So, Maybe this is my opinion. We need the certification for the seaweed result from what you call it, uh, harvest from cultivation. Because, uh, for example, from seaweed association or local government, because it used for protection of the environment where the asparagus. Uh, can get it. Awareness from local uh, fishermen or for farmer how to improve uh, about the marine environment protection. Maybe in the Australian, maybe in the USA, it's not so very, very important. But in development country like Indonesia, the certification is very, very uh, important, I think. And the third opinion, you, you explain about the industry, industry need, priority, regulation, collaboration, investment. And maybe I will give one point, provide human resource development. Why human resource development is very important? It is for development country. Dr. Rob, human resources is uh, what you call it uh, to improve the, the the person how to use how to cultivate the asparagopsis because maybe in our our country there are one or two species of this asparagopsis but not yet cultivated yeah? not yet or the people not yet know. How is the importance of this species like this? That's why we, we what you call it, we, we held this uh, seminar. And special for Stefan Grant in, uh, from Ireland. It is also a nice uh, presentation. Uh, also, you saw a nice picture. And the picture figure about the process, how the asparagopsis play as important thing or important algae to reduce uh, methane gas production. In slide four or uh, five, my opinion about this species, can we substitute with another species? I mean, you show that Asparagopsis armata, a very, very important and uh, your uh, your country, so can we change maybe not not uh, as as paracopsis armata because the species produce uh, iodine and brom, and this iodine and brom is not is not so good for health or for human consumption. So this is uh, my opinion. So and the third presentation for Dr. Steve Miller from USA. It is also a nice presentation from uh, USA. USA is also uh, look like another country to provide meat need for human, uh, for human 
they get from remu, uh, re, remnant uh, livestock. Those production of the, what you call it, uh, this production of the meat of the ruminant livestock will increase year by year. But as uh, Steph Miller described, that ruminant livestock in USA will use asparagus seeds to reduce uh, methane production. The algae can be, uh, what you call it, uh, harvested from sea farm or produced from sea farm or from uh, or under aquaculture. So we can't imagine how much, how many we need after cryptocurrencies, special in USA. So maybe we can change the species or maybe you can more explain which species is very, very important to reduce uh, methane gas. I think this is my, what you call it, my opinion about the third uh, presentation. So we can uh, develop in a uh, question. Thank you, Pa Sundari, please. Thank Pa Abi. I think uh, <clears throat> uh, all the speakers, resource person can uh, address the comment from Pa Abi Susanto just now. I will start uh, from uh, Dr. Rob Kenley and uh, uh, <clears throat> Rican Group, and then uh, to Pa Stefan Karan, and then to Dr. Steve Miller. Yes, please. Hi, yeah, you, you make some very great points and thank you for those uh, very, very astute points that you've made and I'll try to approach them. Uh, there was a fair number there, so feel free to remind me if, if there's something that I missed as I respond to the, the parts that were um, addressed to me. Uh, sargassum, you mentioned sargassum uh, and there'd been some work done and, and there were some hopes around that. Yes. Well, let me let me speak about seaweeds in general. Yeah. There seems to be some pretty good effects from most seaweeds. And uh -huh. and not all of those effects are directly related to direct methane mitigation. So mm -hmm. there's some nutritional benefits from sea feeding seaweeds. Uh, so and in in the wider scope of things Seaweeds can have a number of very beneficial um, uh, responses in the animals, and that can be anywhere from a an improved immune response to um, improved weight gain, and and of course, as we heard from Stefan, that for hundreds of years seaweeds have been uh, supplemented to cattle to help them uh, at times when the fodder is is a little bit poor. Okay, okay. Sargasm okay. specifically now, I have tested that for its methane potential. And yes, if fed at, at levels of pro, over five up to even 20% uh, of the dietary intake, it, it can reduce methane. But when you start getting into higher levels like that, there, there's some issues with digestibility and performance in the animals. So that level of intake is, is not likely to be economical either. Okay. So the, 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 res, the anti-methane response from sargassum can, can be 5 to 10% at, at a level of 2 or so percent yeah. of dietary intake. The, the difference there is sargassum as a brown algae doesn't it, it doesn't maintain or, or retain those halogenated bioactive compounds that um, that's myself and Stefan and Steve and Reagan have alluded to. Okay. Uh, but most seaweeds actually produce those, but it's a very special gland cell that we saw. In, in a couple of slides that uh, retains those bioactive compounds that makes asparagopsis so special. Okay. But asparagopsis is very widespread now. It's traveled 
Um, it, it's likely in Indonesia in some areas. It's not as abundant around the equator where the water gets very warm. But Taxiformis is a tropical seaweed and it's likely to be around in Indonesia uh, to some extent and could likely be cultivated because it's, it's probably already there. Um, the farther you get from the equator, the more abundant it's likely to be. Stefan can add to that. He would have some good knowledge on, on that aspect. You talked about um, wild harvesting. Yeah. Wild harvesting is what we've done so far because it's the only source that we had as we were approaching um, or moving into our research and, and progressing in that way. So there was no other source. That's changing now. And we are bringing cultivated material into our trials in our next round of research. But it's still not um, at the level that we need for commercial marketing. But Steve has alluded to the speed at which this is coming on. And so the early stage development is advancing very quickly and very soon those hectare size plantations will have uh, a, an output that will be uh, very important in the commercial uptake. And from, from a very simple perspective, wild mm -hmm. harvesting is just too expensive. It's not economic or sustainable. So That's as a small supply, from certain specific regions where, uh, for instance, it might be helpful to remove it where it could be clouding reefs and things like that um, as an invasive species, taking it from there becomes uh, worthwhile doing. And so okay. those kinds of sources would be, would be good. But the tank-based culture, um, which will feed into the ocean-based culture, through the life cycles that we heard from both Stefan and Steve, uh, those, those aspects will okay. work together, but the vast amounts will come from the ocean. Mm -hmm. So developing areas, yes, absolutely important to developing areas, because this can be new economies and replacement economies that we heard from both Stefan, and, well, from Reagan, Stefan and Steve. Uh, mm. this, this is a, a very important along those ways. So rather than continue, I'll, I'll let um, Stefan and Steve have a, have a bit of time here. And if we come back to me, that'd be good. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Stefan or Steve, please, yeah. if any, any comment on, or? Well, I'll, I'll try to address as well the, the, the questions direct to me. Um, mm. And I really had to, to, to stay awake because this was a very, very long question. And I had to write it all down, but um, just just one comment uh, on the sargasm, um, mm. because, yeah, uh, what Rob already said, what is happening there, you see a small reduction uh, and, and we all thought, ah, sargasm, that is a nice solution because there's 13 million tons of this stuff floating around in the Caribbean. It's a big problem, mm. but there is one issue with sargasm and that is inorganic arsenic. And mm. that is way too high. And that is an issue if you start to use that in feed. Mm. So that is for me already, or not for me, basically for the regulatory uh, <laughs> bodies in, in either the States or the EU or, or where, an issue. So the, we probably can't use that unless we use very small inclusion levels. Um, then on the question of iodine and brome in, in Asparagopsis armata, yeah. Yeah. This, is, this is not only Armata, this is basically in those type of seaweeds, and it can be Bonamazonia, that can be Asparagopsis, the so, or uh, even other types of reds have these okay. compounds. Okay. But yes, it, it is very high, for example, in Asparagopsis, but iodine is also very high in some edible species that we consume every day. Okay. And okay, that can be kelp from from uh, China or Korea or Japan, and that is just used as a sea vegetable. So the whole issue on iodine is relative, in my opinion, and okay. more to do with sentiment and a, a set value that was established in 1962 by the World Health Organization of 150 micrograms per day. 
which in Japan is, is consumed four times as much per day. Okay. So that depends on where you are in the world and how string that, uh, stringent that, that uh, rule is. Other species than Armata, yes, definitely. There is different types of rats with a similar kind of uh, bromoforms, mm. but we don't know how to cultivate those yet. And uh, I myself have tried Capophytus, for example, or Grasslaria, mm. also mm. to see what are the effects. And mm. you're all in that 20, maybe 30% range of reduction. Mm. Only Asparagopsis is the one that really can achieve 90% reduction in vitro mm. as, as well in vivo. So there is no quick fix to say, oh, we're going to use a different species. And okay. I'm not, not talking about uh, health and well-being, food conversion, uh, because we use seaweeds and different blends of seaweeds for the last 15 years now in, in dairy and beef supplements. Okay. But that is really for improving health, uh, lowering somatic cell count, uh, increased protein levels in the milk and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, we, we, we basically have to do this with asparagopsis. Now, I can only say to Rob, you're very happy and a lucky man to have Steve in your camp down in <laughs> New Zealand and in Australia. Because for us, it's not a clear-cut road to say, oh, right, let's start growing 2,000 hectares of Asparagopsis. It is really a political problem, and it has to be solved at government and political level in the EU to see and plot a way forward. It's not that easy for us, unfortunately. And we still plow ahead with what we do, with okay. small amounts of growing and, and doing the trials and stuff. But we are also there, like, if we want to commercialize it, it has to be approved. Okay. Else, it, else it will be a dead end for us. Clear. Thank you. Okay. Um, again, lots of questions. It's almost midnight my time, so I'm, I'm also... <laughs> Sorry, sorry. No, that's okay, actually, because I have to be up at 6 a.m. to do another presentation for something else. But um, so let me let me chat a couple of things. Um, you have in quite a number of places that I know of um, in Indonesia, you have um, local species of Asparagopsis taxiformis. Mm. We already know it grows well in the wild in Sabah. Um, right, so all around both sides, all three sides of the Celebra Sea, where we have Indonesia, the Philippines, and Malaysia come together, is a great place. We already know that's where you grow most of your seaweeds uh, within, at least in Sulawesi, right? So it exists. The partnership we have with the, uh, with the Malaysian company actually exists now as a joint venture headquartered mm -hmm. in Singapore. We haven't announced it yet, so that's why I won't talk about it. Um, but we'll be using, we are already using, I should say, local strains, local selected strains of Asparagopsis taxiformis in the culture development and in the tank development that's going on now in Saba. Mm. Um, so that's underway. That, those strains are not different than the ones you have 200 kilometers away yeah. um, within there. So. Um, Part of our business model, what's important and part of the reason why we selected that partnership in Malaysia, uh, you know, what they had focused on was the development of Capophycus within there, but not so much about it as a commercial enterprise, which was their goal, but the relationships they developed with thousands of local farmers to be able to grow it in small plots, small family plots, but it aggregates up to a significant enough supply of Capophycus to make it commercially viable. Mm. The business model for us is very simple. We don't plan to grow much at all. That makes no sense. There are aquatic aquaculture farmers the world over in regions where Asparagopsis is native that already have assets that are stranded. So let's just use South Australia today. If you're a tuna farmer, you have a boat that sits in, you have a $20 million boat that sits in dry dock nine months of the year. It's a stranded asset. What about if you could use that same boat to grow on your own lease that you already have asparagopsis? What you need is the seeded lines from us. Okay. 
and us to be able to teach some of the optimization ways to harvest it. Because the second you remove it from the water, there are certain things you have to do to it in order to maximize bromoform preservation. If you don't, you will lose it. Um, so that's part of the business model. We work with local, we will ultimately, when it's at scale, work with local growers to leverage their own assets, their own people um, to, to extend uh, their ability to bring in revenue, whether they're growing other fin fish or other shellfish, these things, as, as Rob talked about early on, can in fact be grown together in a way where it can enhance fin fish production by taking up all of that excess nitrogen from those fin fish. And so there's a feed forward system in there. So business model for us is very simple, partner with local farmers to be able to grow it um, and then sell it back to us at a dollar per ton that makes a profit for those farmers. So on the other end, we're also partnering with setting up and establishing partnerships with major distribution systems, both within Australia and other parts of the world that will allow it to be able to be leveraged and material to be able to be supplied around the world. We build, own and operate hatchery processing and formulation facilities. That's what we do. That's where the secrets are. That's where the knowledge is. That's where you control product quality, um, which is the critical thing to do in any newly developing field. Okay. Um, let me talk about the US. We don't plan to grow it in the US. Again, there, there's a partnership with which we will ultimately develop. Um, you know, once we know how to do all of this uh, at scale, in fact, you can't grow it in the US other than Hawaii. So the continental 48 of the US, even though there's 101 million cows in the US, dairy and beef, there's no native species in the continental 48. Can't import one. You'll contravene a whole bunch of biodiversity treaties from the United Nations. You can only grow it in the ocean util utilizing and leveraging native species. There are no native species in the continental United States. There is in Hawaii, Taxiformis is native there, as, as uh, I think both Rob and Stefan alluded to. Uh, Native Hawaiians have eaten this for well, well in excess of a century as a condiment. And so what's really important, you go back to the principles I described to you. If you're going to grow it at large scale in Hawaii and it's not going to interfere with tourism, we've just mm -hmm. gotten rid of most of the available growing space. If it's not yeah. going to interfere with recreational fishing, or transportation lines or other industries. You can't grow it at commercial yeah. scale in the ocean. You can grow it in tanks, and there are at least two companies attempting That's right. to do that in there. Um, and you can grow it in tanks in landlocked countries if you understand the economics and you can then process it in this standardized facility with which we'll build. Yeah. The last one that I wanted to talk about, which is important, is this question on iodine and bromine. Mm. It's important from a regulation standpoint, as Stefan said, uh, not so much when you think about uh, beef feedlot cows does not become a commercial issue then because it's not transferred over into the cow at a level that's problematic. It certainly is in milk and the accumulation in, in milk. Um, version 2.0, so version 1.0 is what I showed you from the commercial production and development. We also have some work. We have, we have a huge capability around uh, process and formulation within our company. It's where most of the expertise in our company comes from, the background from Procter & Gamble. So, you know, my, we have like 160 years of commercial expertise at Procter & Gamble, who's the world's largest consumer products company. And what P&G does is its business model is incredibly simple. It takes raw materials that other anyone else can, can purchase and it does product development on the on the material and out the other end comes premium priced, superior performing, intellectual property protected products that delight the world's consumers. That's PNG's business model. That's what we do. We don't grow seaweed to sell seaweed. We build branded products that meet the needs of the customers who use it. Very important. Yeah. So in that, there are formulation approaches that we will have in the future, and I mean, couple of years from now, not 10 years, where we'll be able to remove all or most of the iodine and bromine from the seaweeds. 
I'm not going to share how, but there are some approaches that are viable to be able to do that for markets for which will not budge, like the EU, uh, despite the fact that their only viable way the EU can reach its commercial targets of 50 to 55% greenhouse gas reductions is to do this at mass scale across the EU. There's no other way they can achieve those. Despite that, they'll adhere to their uh, regulations and say, no, we won't allow it under these conditions. But nevertheless, there are formulation ways to deal with that problem in the future. Can you come to Ireland, uh, Steve? <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm almost, <laughs> Stephen, I'm almost a, uh, uh, a guest citizen of Ireland. I did, I did a lot of products and development. There are a couple in the market now that I, that I developed with some Irish companies in my P&G days. So, yes, in fact, I'll actually be uh, the world's first TED conference on greenhouse gases is two weeks before COP26 in Scotland. And I'm going to give two different presentations and talks about climate change impact and methane uh, there. So I'll be just across the water, but I won't have time, Stefan, on this trip. But uh, I'll, I assure I'll send, you, I'm, I'll send our Minister of Agriculture down there. You probably I am, there, ha- so. I am happy to have a conversation <laughs> with him. So. Yeah, very good. Very good. Thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Steve and Stefan. And uh, so, Rob, I think it's very good. Yeah. So, okay, Bobby, thank you. Thank you. Temporary, yes. Yeah. Thanks, Bobby. Yeah. So yeah. I think uh, the next uh, discussion enough, enough. is, uh, yeah, I think <laughs> I'd like enough, to invite, uh, yes, thank you, I'd like to invite uh, pa- Aswan yes. to give a review or okay. a question on this uh, for the presentation. Yes, please, pa- Aswan. Okay. Thank you. Uh, sorry. I prepare sort the uh, PowerPoint to share the idea of mine and hopefully uh, I wish that all presenter, all presenter, Dr. Steve, Dr. Stephen, Dr. Rob and Dr. Rejan could okay. share also their opinion yeah. about my presentation. Pasan, <clears throat> can you do it in five minutes? Okay, oh, it's very short. <laughs> okay, wait, please wait. Yeah. Please wait. Yeah, just yeah. six slides, not yes. many slides. Okay, yes, quickly. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, please. Oh, man. So, I just <clears throat> saw the short question about our webinar today. Aslan, the screen is not yet here. Yeah, yeah, just uh, started yeah, downloading. Oh, so I, I started repeated. Sorry. You oh open my. first and then share. Okay. Buka dulu, Pak, baru di share. Okay, okay. Stop, stop, stop dulu. Hmm. Stop dulu. Okay. Buka dulu, baru di share. Yeah. Okay. Is it okay? Yeah. Already open? Yeah. Yeah. Is it already? Yes. It's already open? Yes. Yeah, open already. Yes. Please uh, well, slide so okay. then uh, yeah. Thank you. you I'm it. very happy today because I meet all asparagopsis expert from many countries and I could share also my opinion regarding the possibility for developing asparagopsis especially from the production aspect but from all presentation done previously I have only one simple question for ourselves as Indonesian my simple question is what should the Indonesian do? Because we understand that all the presenter today come from more developed countries in terms of asparagopsis development. But anyway, I start to, to discuss about Huh? 
Aslan. Okay. Can you put it in a slide show, please? Yeah. Okay. Slide show, slide. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, 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 oh. Slide show. This. Uh, okay, you can you can find this okay then. Okay. okay. I will say present the current status of Aspergops development in Indonesia. We already discussed in our TSIN group regarding the development of Aspergopsis. And we found that there are some challenges for developing the important seaweed called Aspergopsis. First, we are lacking of studies concerning biological and ecological aspects especially for distribution pattern, habitat. I'm focusing on the sustainable and suitable sites for aquaculture development. Even the Dr. Steve already mentioned that many chance to find out, to find that this uh, species in central part of Indonesia, especially in the Sulawesi or near Malaysia or Philippines, but we have uh, limited information regarding the uh, existence of these species in the field. In addition, we also have a challenge in the quantity of wild stock. No report we found from our Indonesian researcher about regarding this uh, challenge. And this, so I say that for the ecological aspect, we have three important points should be answered for our Indonesian scientists. First, what's the current suitable habitat for Asparagopsis taxis for Miss Indonesia? And the second, what are the most important environmental variables? Because uh, we understand that Indonesia is belong to tropical, but Ireland or Southern, South Australia or New Zealand is uh, belong to subtropical, um, could be temperate zone. That's the way we have to look in detail what's the environmental cues or environmental parameters. It can uh, limit the distribution and at least they can be a handicap for uh, uh, Aspargopsis culture in Indonesia. And uh, the third is what the what are the most suitable cultivation sites? This is also important because we have many uh, areas, suitable area for tropical, especially the Kafa Paikos, Gracile, but we don't know where the location actually suitable for habitat of uh, uh, for uh, uh, cultivating the asparagopsis okay i return to the second slide and no seedling facilities especially hatchery yeah we uh, very we understand that australian or new zealand probably in ireland also already developed uh, some technologies or some finding related to the hatchery development but unfortunately we in Indonesia is very limited uh, 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 technology for developing or for building the hatcheries for uh, aspar asparagops asparagopsis seedlings. Yeah, we understand that for developing or, or mass uh, cultivation, we need a hatchery for supporting the availability of seedling. And the second is, the third is no farming activities. Yeah, Indonesia also, until this day, we have no information regarding the no uh, activities of farming of these uh, uh, communities. That's why the cultivation technique for optimal growth and also in harvesting is uh, very uh, lacking here in Indonesia. And then the Next is not no technology for livestock feed industry. Yeah, it's very far, it's a, uh, a wide gap between the countries, especially Australia, New Zealand, and related to the technology for livestock 
tech industry. And this, the last, last is very few collaboration. That's why I'm very happy also that we are meet we meet meet with the all ex expert today. I, we hope that this is a continuation. What should we do for the next step after uh, the, this uh, webinars ended? Okay, I will continue to the next slide. That's why for this. Uh, uh, opportunities, I propose six programs needed to be implemented. First, developing a spirograph culture technique close to the life cycle for spirograph and optimize grow out technique. This is already a mention of Stefan or Steve, uh, Dr. Steve and Dr. Stefan. And then also, second is building a following hatchering. Yeah, we, we understand that for such to maintain the sustainable uh, seedling supply, we need a hatchering at least in the center uh, area where the asparagopsis will be cultivated in the sea water, in the sea. Eh? Okay, and that's why we need uh, we, we need uh, also a seed bank program. Yeah. The third, initiating and developing collaboration. We am very happy also that, I am very happy also that when we see the presentation of Dr. Steve and Dr. Stephen, there is a, a both of these scientists is uh, uh, give some opportunities to make a collaboration. We hope that Indonesia is the first, probably is the first country in Southeast Asia have a collaboration to uh, uh, develop these uh, communities in the future, in the next days in the next years yeah okay and, and then we supporting progress of advanced cultural technology yeah so we hope that the technologies developed from australia from new zealand or from Milan could be broke to indonesia because i would i would like to say that indonesian government from this time being already have a strong uh motivation also from strong interest to develop asparagopsis here in Indonesia. Okay, next is developing the environmental standard. This is also very important because we, uh, we think that uh, environmental standard, especially by making the standard operational procedure is as valuable guidance, it's very important, especially for our farmers. And the last is developing research, development and extension, especially asparagopsis value chain into a five-year plan. Why I put a, a propose, I propose a five-year plan because I understand that Australia or New Zealand scientists or other scientists belong to asparagopsis expert already developed long, long time ago, more probably 15 or 20 years ago. That's why we need a, a, a long-term development, not only one or two years, at least five years. Five years is very short to develop a community, important communities. But anyway, we have to start it now after this seminar. Yeah, we didn't need to wait until next time, but we have to do it because in term for saving our planet from methane emission, this is, this is the way, the very useful way by developing asparagopsis and the important commodities to save our earth, to save our uh, global, from the global climate change. This is very important for our future. I, our future days in. I think that's all of our comment and I need uh, some uh, comment also from our expert. Thank you, Pa, Pa Aslan. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot. I think uh, it's very good. I, I think it's uh, kind of uh, make some recommendation or suggestion. This is for our side for Indonesia. I think, but uh, there are also uh, expectation of uh, collaboration with. Uh, uh, with uh, the, the resource, the, the speakers. 
So, Prabhu, I would like to invite the uh, speakers to give some uh, comment on the on this one, Prabhu, that we can uh, can take forward for our consolidation here in uh, Indonesia. Yes, please. I, I like to uh, now start from uh, Steve Miller first, and then Pak Sudari. Mohon yeah. maaf, uh, Pak Aslan boleh diturunkan ininya share screennya. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, Pak Aslan, please stop screen. Baik, terima kasih. Yeah, I'd like to invite uh, Steve Miller for us, please. Yeah. Sure. So um, I have a couple of comments. Thank you for sharing. And I think all of that um, in a normal world makes sense. We don't live in a normal world now. We live in the middle of a climate crisis. And our politicians don't, I believe, yet understand the magnitude of the problem we have. Um, so that said... Our mission is very simply to scale with urgency to address that reason. Fortunately, we don't have the key issue that Stefan has. We don't have to go get permission to grow it in the ocean, um, you know, which is a complicating problem, but I think will solve itself when the commercial feasibility of asparagopsis's impact becomes a lot clearer to regulators around the world and where the opportunity really is, both for climate change mitigation over this next decade um, and also for economic growth. But those things will go away. But nevertheless, and, and more research on efficacy and safety that will go along with it. So in a normal world, that would be a good progression but we're not in a normal world. So my suggestion to you is perhaps a little bit different. Mm. You don't need to spend a whole bunch of time setting up research programs for the next five years. Yeah. That's not a useful use of resources, both people's time and yours. That research is already ongoing in companies like Seaweed Company, uh, CH4 Global, Future Feed, and, and quite a number of others now, specifically around asparagopsis. Um, we know a lot more about it. What the government in Indonesia should be doing is seeking commercial relationships that allow them to leverage what's known and provide access to be out to the water space um, for those opportunities to be developed for economic and environmental social and cultural impact for local growers um, spread throughout. And that conversation needs to happen first. There is, I don't believe, a lot of use in trying to set up research collaborations at this stage. It's not a useful period of time. We've passed many of those research pieces that we believe are needed to bring it to commercial scale now. There's a lot more research to do on, on, on upgrade versions. And so really, and as, as you heard me say, unfortunately you wouldn't be the first in Southeast Asia. You already heard me say, we have a collaboration now, a commercial collaboration with a commercial research and development group in, um, in Sabah, um, already working now on hatchery development with local strains from Malaysia based upon all of the knowledge we have. Now, fortunately, they're just coming out of sort of a COVID lockdown so they can get back into the, to the hatchery development work. So within six months, we should have a fully operational hatchery functioning there um, and significant amounts of seeded material in water in evaluating it. It's not very far from where you are. That, that relationship and commercial partnership is going to eventually develop a, a year or two behind where we are now um, and we'll start exploring where do we build commercial facilities for the hatchery for the processing at scale but we need to understand a little more in terms of the local species and that's the work for the next probably 12 months within there um, so the opportunity I think is different than what you laid out from my standpoint at least anyway and that's from a government standpoint to seek to seek commercial relationships that bring value, economic value in particular, um, to Indonesia. And that means getting in a room and talking about what's possible, not talking about what's not possible. 
We don't need a conversation where someone's going to say, well, we'd have to do four years of regulatory work and we need to do three years of economic assessment programs. That mm -hmm. world doesn't exist today if you want to have impact. That means yes. you sit in a room with people who says, wow, you know, if we did it this way or if we changed what we did, it doesn't mean do anything that's commercially inappropriate or break regulations. Mm -hmm. It means if we did it this way, we could actually move that along more quickly. That's the conversation that needs to happen at a government level to work out how it could embrace the impact of, of creating a completely new economically viable, sustainable industry. Mm -hmm. um, so that's my suggestion back for you to think about from within Indonesia, how might that happen? And I would be happy to participate in some of those conversations. Yeah. Perhaps mm -hmm. we find a relationship, perhaps we don't, but I would be happy to participate to help mm -hmm. point out why the urgency is critically important for what we need to do. So that's some comments I have. So I'm, perhaps yeah. others may have some as well. Okay, yeah. thank you, thank Steve. You. Yeah, I think if, if uh, Pasan can approach the yes. Sulawesi provincial government, yeah, provide yes, that, yes, yes. provide that will be good. I think that's okay. a very thank you, thank you, Pasan. No need, yeah. no need to spend money, resources to do research. Yes, the technology already there. Just provide the uh, access to the water yes. for for farming something like for business directly. Talking about the business, yeah. I think that's there is some there is some research that one has to yeah. do within there, yeah. but it's not a five year research program. It's a five year yeah. commercial development program oh, for yes. an industry. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Sure. yes. Thank, you. thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Steve. Stefan. Yes, Stefan. You have any comment? Yeah, I do indeed. Uh, thank you, Pan Sudari, um, and thank you, Professor Aslan, for the layout of the plan. Um, like what Steve said. That would be an ideal scenario, um, but we all know it, it often doesn't go like that. It's also the reason why we try to commercialize it in Ireland, but we are already growing this stuff in India, and we are actually setting up in Timor, West Timor as well, which is in Indonesia, of course. Um, we had, and, and I have to thank uh, Boo Dika Rina Kuki uh, for this, uh, and also Pa Jimmy here on, on the call, discussions about this with MOMAF and Ministry of Industries on the opportunities that are there also for Asparagopsis. And we had strategic webinars with these organizations in Indonesia involved and with Arli and with Astrudi to look at these opportunities. So that is already set in motion, I think. And it, it is more in getting the green light from the government. And, and that is just something that we have to deal with and that has to be obtained. And that comes down to education and information in the direction of the different ministries in Indonesia. And once they see it's a good idea, then we, we're off to the races and these things can take place. But we don't start from square one there are already a couple of things uh, happening and and steve is of course right the technology is there don't start really from the bottom and, and reinvent the wheel just take what is there and then start to commercialize this as well because indonesia is of course the best platform if you look at all the family units the farming of capophicus of brasilaria that's going on or yukuma it is almost like a, a seamless changeover or, or a, a, a bolt on to what is already happening there. So that, that would be my comments, uh, Professor Aslan. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, uh, Pastor Stefan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a good. I think Pastor Stefan is uh, has, uh, been uh, working in Indonesia. I think he's expert of uh, CPA project also. So probably that uh, so can uh, can cover this area for the. For the for this uh, collaboration. Uh, now I think I I uh, like to invite uh, Dr. Rob Gunley. Probably you have any uh, comment or suggestion. I I do have, but I will say it's it, it it's tremendously easy for me to do these panel discussions and Q and A's with guys like Steve and Stefan um, on the panel as well. That they, they've done a very good job to. Uh, not only explain what 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 the 
I mean, the state of play is, but also to bring into my own mind some, some other things that I, I might bring to you. So firstly, um, from Steve's perspective, from Stefan's perspective, from the perspective of all of those out there who are currently growing and attempting and planning to grow Asparagopsis at scale, mm -hmm. they're all starting from scratch. They're, they're all finding their way based on their current um, state of play, but also the, the climatic and environmental and regulatory issues that differ everywhere that, that you will try to do this. So there are some nuances that Indonesia will have to take into account that differ from other regions, but the actual art of growing the seaweed won't differ all that much. And so you can use the models of, for instance, what's going on in Malaysia and the Philippines yes. and, and in Australia. It, those are good models to use. And Steve said it much better than I would be able to say it. There's no need to reinvent the wheel. Yes. There's no need to spend vast amounts of resources. Yes. The most important of which here is time to to develop something that there is knowledge already developed. Yeah. So there are folks out there who who you can bring to your camp to help you, who may already be skilled, or those who you can get skilled um, in relatively quick fashion relative to starting from scratch, which you'll have to do when it comes to your infrastructure uh, your facilities, all of which were previously described, um, that are specific to the regions where um, CH4 Global and the Seaweed Company are currently working, but others also that can help you in, in, in order to do that. So those are models for you to, to call upon. Uh, the nuances you have to deal with will be specific to Indonesia that everybody has their own um, hurdles to get over, but uh, but there is a way over them, and the pressure to do that is mounting, as Steve and Stefan both were uh, quite eloquent in describing. Um, from Future Feed's perspective, Future Feed is not a seaweed grower per se. Future Feed counts on and is depending upon. Um, innovative folks like Stefan and Steve and their teams and others to come up with the technology to put seaweed into the market. So see, the seaweed will get into the mouths of cattle through these licensees and their partners Future Feed will manage that side of the program. I'm not sure if Reagan is still on or, or if she wanted to make any further comment on that. But um, that's where Future Feed comes into play. The seaweed technology uh, will, will come to us through, through the efforts of what we've heard from Stefan and Steve. Yeah, thanks, Robert. I am here. Um, I think you gave a, a, that's the overview of um, our, our job is really at the animal science side. So we invest the, the resources and the time and the expertise of, of Dr. Rob and his team in understanding the animal science and the methane reduction. And we rely on our seaweed growers to formulate, to develop the seaweed um, and to supply it to, to those livestock producers. So we work well, it's, it's almost two parts of a, of a jigsaw puzzle. We work well together um, in supporting one another. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Dr. Kindi and uh, Dr. Rick and Crook. I think it's very, very good. Uh, so, okay, Baslan, yeah. So, I think uh, we have another more or less, uh, Yeah. Okay. More or less, we you. have another 30 minutes. Yes. I think we need to give uh, our delegate, our participant, to uh, ask questions, yeah. So, I think uh, uh, if there is any question, anybody can. We have some question from the from the from the participant, I will read later on. But uh, 
probably there is a there are participants who like to uh, ask question directly please raise uh, please do so if you can uh, uh, raise a hand yeah we are one or be three yeah ibu santi angraini any other anybody else i saw Ibu Santi Angra ini. Ya. Ya, Bu Santi, oh. please. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, I would like to ask uh, Steve about uh, this uh, blueprint of uh, the hatchery technology. For uh, as you mentioned yeah, that, yeah. as you mentioned that Malaysia oh, has yeah. had a cooperation with your company. Um, can you? Um, mention clearly how much or um, how yeah how big is the infestation for us as uh, because uh, most of you recommend that we may um, it is useless for us to develop the technology from the beginning but it's better to to have a co collaboration with the um, the potential partners such as your company therefore we would like to know uh, and the second is for the for the the cost itself is it also included the adjustment cost if we want to develop our local strain uh, to be fitted into your uh, blueprint technology and the second one uh, is it only for uh, asparagopsis or you also have other technologies for um, doing cultivation for other type of uh, seaweed thank you so the last one I'll do with this, thank you. So it's only, we only focus 100% on asparagopsis, no other seaweed strains. Um, because for us, we didn't build a company to grow seaweed. We built a company to have impact on climate change at scale with urgency. I keep saying that, but that's what we do. That's the reason that I started this company almost three years ago. So the blueprint the physical blueprint i mean and it's not just a hatchery it's a hatchery the processing and the formulation so at the end of the day you're producing a finished product that goes into the market into different market segments the business model and the way we've chosen to do that is not go and build facilities and then try to sell 50 kilo bags of material to someone that will buy it that is not a good business model um the business model that we're choosing to work on is to work with corporations uh, in one way, shape or form who would like to treat or use it for 10,000 cattle, 50,000, 100,000 cattle, pick the number. And the relationship we build with those is about we build the facilities to suit the scale of the number of cows that they wish to treat. So it's a very different way. And that way, I'll call it a build to suit. So if, if company A wants to have access to product for 20,000 cattle in Australia, that's the facility we'll build to supply that, not any extra. And so those facilities and the cost of those facilities depends on the scale of what the production is. Um, but the minimum size of those facilities would suit somewhere between 10 and 15,000 cattle for use. Um, and the numbers for that are in the eight to $10 million to build and construct. The economics of the facilities are very favorable. They have 60% margins on them. Um, and so the payback for the facility is in less than two years. So, but with, as I said, we're not just going to build them and say, oh, now we're producing material. Who'd like to buy some? Not a good model. All it does is drive prices down. You, you know, we want to be able to do this in a, in a responsible manner. So hopefully that addressed your questions. Oh, Santi. Okay, yeah. Still there. Okay, I think, uh, thanks, uh, Steve. I think we have two questions, yes, uh, from Ibu Subi Jain, and then from Pak Ahmad Purnomo. 
Please, Ibu Surumbi, Bapak-Bapak, you can uh, introduce yourself and then ask your question. Address to which speakers, please. Hello. Hi. Uh, thank you for the great talks. I have a question to Dr. Rob Kinley. So I'm a PhD student and I'm working with acetogen. So I know that the acetogens or methanogens get adapted to methane inhibitors very quickly. So what do you have to say regarding adaptation of, uh, uh, like adaptation of methanogens to asparagopsis? Uh, that's, a, um, that, that's a question with two ends on it. So uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the term hormesis. So at very low doses, so for example, as, as a pesticide, mm -hmm. now this has no relation to seaweed, but at very, very low doses, you can actually increase activity uh, against the target that you're facing or, or you're trying to eliminate. The same thing with the seaweed, but what happens at very low doses, it can be adapted to. And when I say very low, it's we notice when we're acclimatizing the animals to the seaweed, that they will adapt um, relatively quickly at the very front end, at that end of the, of the spectrum. So we notice a very quick drop. And uh, in one of my, uh, my slides, it was evident there that at, at the very introductory phase, there was almost, uh, there was a significant drop that was, it, it surprised me when I first saw it because it was like a hundred times less seaweed than we had used in the laboratory. And we were getting very large reductions in methane in the animals. But the animals adapted to that very low level. But when we reached the functional level, I'll call it the minimum effective inclusion rate, adaptation stopped. And if, if you recall in the slide where I showed the transition across the different diets as adaptation to the feedlot diet, the starter diet, the transition, and then the finishing diet for the feedlot cattle, that the effect actually improved. Now that was because of the level of grain in the diet I explained, but the level of in inclusion rate of the seaweed didn't change. So over 180 days, there was no adaptation to the seaweed. It actually improved, with, but that was largely due to the increase in grain. So at this point, we don't see any adaptation. A little bit of a lengthy explanation to get to there, but no adaptation has been seen at this point for okay. up to 180 days. Okay. And we're, of course, heading into longer studies. Mm -hmm. So for example, we are working with monensin in our lab and there we see the problem of adaptation of methanogens or acetogens. So I was just thinking that if it's the same problem with the asparagopsis as well after, I don't like more than one, 185 days, what, what you have shown. Yeah, well, um, monensin is um, quite a famous story. And of course, it's continued to be used because it has much more benefit than just that initial uh, um, reduction in methane. But the, uh, the way that methane is reduced using the halogenated bioactives in the seaweed is much different than that uh, action that's caused by the, the early onset of methane reduction by monensin. But on that line, um, when monensin is added in the feed and seaweed is added in the feed with it, it's during that situation where we've seen the, the greatest reductions, which would be in that, um, that study that was done in Australia, the Kinley et al. 2020 study, where we had 98% uh, emission reduction. So uh, if you might want to take a read of that paper, there's be some talk in there about that. Yeah, I have read that paper. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank, yeah. thank you. Thank you so much. So, yeah, I think uh, thank you, Surubi, for the question. I think uh, like, now move to uh, Pak Ahmad Purnomo for the question. Please, Pak Ahmad, unmute your microphone and address your question. 
Okay. okay, can you hear my voice? Yes. Okay, yeah. Uh, my, my question is, is, is for all, for all speakers. Uh, I, I do believe that uh, any one of you have heard about a blue carbon community. There is vegetation in the coastal zone. Uh, that, is, that is able to absorb uh, carbon from the atmosphere, including seaweed. Now, when we are cultivating seaweed, then we harvest the seaweed, then the carbon that they have absorbed from the atmosphere is released again. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would like to hear your comment regarding this, regarding the, the capability of, of uh, seaweed in uh, reducing the uh, climate change impact. Thank you. Yeah, I, I can start with this, if you don't mind. Yes, um, yes, please, Pastor uh, Ivan. In, indeed, uh, seaweed can take up CO2, or actually not CO2 directly, but through the through the seawater. And yes, it, it fixes carbon for a short period. And after it's used again in food, feed, or other, other application, it's released again. So we talk about transfercation. It basically starts in the sea, goes through the seaweed, goes into something else, released back into the atmosphere. Unless you sink your seaweed farm to the deep sea, but nobody in his right mind would do that because it's a valuable crop, then you can uh, fix carbon for a, a very long time. So in that respect, uh, growing seaweed will not directly solve the CO2 emissions problem. Methane and using seaweed for that to reduce that, that is a different story. So that is two things to really keep separate here in this discussion. Secondly, we also work in agriculture and we make different types of uh, growth stimulants with using seaweed. And we have demonstrated we can fix per hectare now an 11 ton of carbon extra up to a 20 centimeter depth of soil. And now you're starting to talk about long-term uh, fixation because that carbon will stay in the soil for about 10 to 1,000 years. So there is two, two different levels where you can use seaweed to fix carbon either through the methane reduction or through fixation in agriculture crops, crops in soil. But just a seaweed crop to reduce carbon globally, that is from a very short uh, duration because it's released after it's used in different products. So let me just add, so I would echo everything that Stefan had. It's, it's not a good, today at least anyway, uh, unless the price of carbon goes up well beyond $100 a ton, growing it in the ocean to sink it is not a good commercial model. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, but if there's value to be obtained out of that when the world, and, and I actually believe that out of COP26, you know, you will have seen recently that the EU and the US has banded together to, to agree to 30% reductions in methane. I think that target is too low, but 30% reductions in methane through 2030. They're going to apply significant pressure on other countries in the world. There are going to be export and import bans on meat and milk products coming from countries that don't adhere to that 30%. All of that is going to happen. The other thing I actually believe is going to happen out of COP26, that carbon pricing will start to be set based upon the social impact cost of carbon, and that's $100 a ton. So it may get profitable, but what's also true is there are some groups at the moment, and I'm blanking on the name of the company, who is actually doing the research work now on four different seaweed farms in the United States, and they're looking at what is the percentage of the farm in aquaculture in the ocean, which breaks away and actually sinks. And they're, they're doing the totality of the studies. And, and I can tell you what their best estimates are today is about 10% of the biomass that would ordinarily be harvested is lost on average and, uh, and ends up sinking. So, there may be, once all of that data has been generated and utilized and validated, there may potentially be a, a blue carbon piece associated with seaweed grown in aquaculture for that which is lost, but not specifically that which is cultivated for use in higher order products such as asparagopsis. So. Yeah. 
Or is, there, is, there, is there any hope for, for this, for seaweed? No. Not, not. I, I don't think for seaweed in that utilization. I think growing seaweed at large scale for impact on you have a much greater impact, right? If you compare the amount of seaweed grown per hectare and its carbon impact for absorption sinking, even though it's I forget how many times more than trees, um, it's still less than the impact on a cow on methane mitigation at ninety percent in terms of the amount per hectare. So it is more efficient to use it, asparagopsis, and develop it for utilization in uh, feed supplements for methane reduction. That is where you have its biggest effect for asparagopsis. For other seaweeds, you know, they have higher order, high value products. And Stefan's company is working on quite a number of those as are others for other benefits in here. But for it to grow it, use it, sink it, there needs to be at least a hundred dollar a ton carbon pricing to be able to make that financially viable. I think they're, they're at sixty dollars a ton at the moment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, not in the U.S. sadly, but but in Europe you have the, some of the better pricing. I thought it was actually sixty eight euro, but yeah, but we have some of the worst regulatory kind of issues. So yes. <laughs> <laughs> it comes around, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, th there is well, well, there is one uh, uh, way to do this with uh, growing kelp forests in areas that are barren, and these kelp forests, and, and depending on the type of species, they can grow up to ten years, fifteen years old, and that is also a way to for a kind of longer term. But I mean, ten to fifteen years is still not very much long term. But you fix carbon in that way. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, uh, Evan and Steve. Yeah, please. Rob, I, yeah. I wouldn't add much. I wouldn't add much to what I've already heard. They did a great job of uh, of explaining. There's one other aspect that we're currently working on, or um, it, uh, through uh, some researchers in Australia with livestock, is using waste, bio waste of almost any kind, and trying to find out which of these produce a biochar that is helpful to livestock feeds, whether that be through emission reduction or, or removal of other waste products in the feeds or through productivity enhancement. The, the side effect of that is that you use waste products that would, in a, lot, in a lot of cases, would otherwise have just been burned, but also the animal consumes those and then distributes those biochars in the landscape. So you're not using um, fossil fuels or equipment to disturb the land in order to do that distribution. And so through, through the uh, innovative use of things such as dung beetles and, and other aspects, those types of things are proving to be relatively successful. And, and it also turns uh, in, into a higher quality soil environment as well. So, Seaweeds are also part of that picture. Um, harvesting seaweeds that would otherwise have rolled up on the beach and, and would just be decaying there and releasing CO2. And, and so those things are, are feasible, but need to be, uh, it, it's a bit, you have to be a bit picky about what you put into livestock feed, but um, there is feasibility there. Oh. Okay, thanks. Uh, Thanks, Rob. I think I I like to read uh, some questions. Uh, put it in a in a in a, in a link. Yeah, I think some of them already uh, already uh, already uh, answer. I think address. Go down again. I think I uh, let let me read this one. Is it only bromoform bioactive compound that became the major indicator to identify seaweed species as the one can reduce methane production? Can I have a shot at this? Because I get yeah. this question every single time I talk to an investor, especially the second part. Can't we just use bromoform? You can go buy it at Sigma Chemical now, and you should have at it if you think it's going to be useful. But here's why it's not. Bromoform at high concentrations is toxic, both to the atmosphere and ozone impact. It's toxic mm. to humans. It's listed by the US uh, Department of Health and Human Services as a potential carcinogen. 
So at high concentrations, you don't want to go anywhere near it. You don't want to order a big tanker load from, uh, uh, from um, you know, chemical company A, have it transported, the truck tips over, you've got an enormous environmental disaster. Leaving that aside, the data at least that's been looked at would suggest that you might get at best a 30% effect when used with bromoform. Why is that true? Well, at least in taxiformis and Amata, there's close to, in one, less than 100, uh, 95 in Amata, generally speaking, at least of what we've looked at. And in taxiformis, just a little bit over 100 other halogenated volatile materials that likely all have a contribution in some way, shape or form. Uh, bromoform is clearly the highest concentration of all of them, which is why bromoform to me is just the surrogate to be used for every single one of the others. And it is highly likely that there's a synergistic effect between a variety of them within there in terms of their total impact. Just like it's true for every other natural product, except three examples that I can think of, where there's been an individual chemical isolated from a natural material that's used in human therapeutic approaches in one way, shape or form, you know, aspirin being an example from willow bark as one example. Everywhere else, it's a synergistic enhancement of multiple potential materials to provide you an overall benefit. We don't know the answer to that question, and it's not one that's worth looking at trying to do bromoform is fraught with it. It'll be a regulated chemical when used. You still have to formulate it into a way because it's highly volatile. How are you going to encapsulate and formulate a highly volatile material into a product that you then have to figure out how to dose to cows? And how do you do that in a facility without human exposure at very high concentration levels? Not a good way to potentially consider at all. So hopefully I... Uh, nailed the head on that particular one you definitely okay. did steve uh, you did one, steve one more uh, you... thing here to mention and that is <laughs> it's a natural product yes okay. yeah and there's yet one more thing <laughs> there's yet one more thing but steve you you definitely nailed it the one thing that's that i would add is that besides being natural it's a natural encapsulation yes so <laughs> So it's, it's in the rumen in an encapsulated form in the cells of, these, of the algae and is released as such from an encapsulation as opposed to a, a chemical. It's a great example of a version of biomimicry. The plant makes the dosing vehicle. Our goal as a company, but everyone's goal is how do you preserve these gland cells intact when you remove all the water and process it into a product you want to give because nature's created the packaging system where the entire hundred of those materials are packaged inside that gland cell complexed in there and you need to preserve the integrity of a biological matrix inside of a biological membrane inside of a wet seaweed when you process it this is not an easy task um, it's incredibly difficult task to be honest but if you can do that, as Rob said, none of it comes out, none of it goes anywhere. If you've done your job well, it all goes into the rumen at a low concentration that provides that effect, that enz enzymatic blockade of the production of, of uh, methane. So, yeah. Thanks. Go done, Balaras. Done, 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 done. Yeah, Prof. Dari. Terus, terus, terus. Terus. Terus, terus. I think this is some already answer, ya. Yeah? Terus, terus, ya. Yeah? For me, it's okay. Going this, too this, quick one, to this, see. this one, this one. Yeah, yeah. You're going quick to see, as mm -hmm. Stefan was going to say. But there's one you just passed. I'd like to go back to. Go up one more. Up, 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 up. Uh, there. So the question about the distribution of the species in mm -hmm. Southeast Asia. That's work that has to be done. There has to be work to map out exactly where it is. And if you don't do it in the middle of the growing season, you're going to go to a region and say, oh, well, it's not here. You go back three months later in the middle of the growing season, all of a sudden it is. So it goes into a dormancy stage. So that's work 
that is absolutely worth investing in from an Indonesia standpoint to determine where is Asparagopsis in its native state. And mapping it would be an incredibly helpful, useful piece of information. It's not known other than there. There are anecdotal reports of where it's been found over the last century all around the world. But that piece would be actually worth spending resources on. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Go, go down. I think this is a good point. Yeah. Down. Ba? Down. Up, 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 up. I think there is some question. Up, 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 up. Is, uh, is it the only promo from bioactive compound that become the major indicator to identify seaweed species? Yeah, this is the question. Mm -hmm. Well, from super, well, super. It's been answered as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Continue. Down. Close. Okay. Can you go back up? There was another one on growing at 12 months of the year. So here we go. Stop. Um, yes. <laughs> it's hard to grow it because its normal cycle is dependent significantly on the environmental conditions within the water. So for, uh, for Amata, as Stefan would know, there's a growing season that's defined in the numbers of months uh, in which you can effectively do it. In a tank on land, you can control those conditions and effectively grow it um, 12 months of the year. In South Australia, where we have um, our Australian base of operations, we're fortunate that both taxiformers and Amata are native species in South Australia. And if you look at it, there are two large gulfs that come in from the Southern Ocean. And the temperature and depths of those gulfs actually allow both species to grow natively. And we actually have great evidence of them growing on the same sandbar different times of the year. And so in South Australia, uniquely of anywhere else that I know of in the world, not only are both species in the same region in here, it potentially allows us to extend the growing season out actually to 12 months. But that's sort of unique to that region. You are correct. The issue that you've identified there in the last two words on the wet season is a tropical storm comes through and it destroys all of the integrity of the backbones that have been laid out. Now you deal that with today in Sulawesi with the existing seaweed industry, but that is going to be a problem here. Uh, Ponds again, and tanks again, are more feasible, yeah. Again, you're a lucky man, Steve. You have both species. We do. Uh, <laughs> uh, for us, it's also lucky because we alternate with another seaweed species that we grow that you see in mm. the back, background of this photo, which is Alaria, it's a kelp. And we grow that late autumn uh, over the winter and harvest it in late spring. So we're talking about first week of May. And then over the summertime, that's when our asparagopsis starts to grow because in the winter you won't find it. So we can run 24-7 the farm as well in the winter growing one and in the summer growing another species. But like in Indonesia you need the dry season also for the other species and you will get competition. And what is more important, carrageenan or agar or asparagopsis. And, and that is something that has to be figured out. But I'd rather see it as a bolt on to what is already there as industry and then expand on the infrastructure and grow asparagopsis in tandem with that. Yeah. Thank you. I think a uh, very interesting discussion. I think there are still a lot of questions, but... Uh... Unfortunately, time limit us. So I think we will select some question again, and then probably we can uh, the organizer can uh, forward it to you, and then to test if, uh, if there is any question that's still uh, not answered. So uh, and now time is uh, for the closing. But before that, I'd like to thank Pastor Stephen Kran, Pastor Stevie Miller, and then also uh, Dr. Robbie. Uh, <coughs> Kenley and also Dr. Regan Group for the excellent presentation and also discussion. And also to Abe Susanto and Pa Aslanya for the discussion. So I think thank, thanks a lot for the all the participants. Now uh, big applause to the to the all the speakers and also to the discussion.
time now I pass it to uh, Ibu Laras, to organizer, to close the webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Pak. Thank you, Pak Stephen, Pak Steve, and also Rob. My Baik. pleasure. Sekali lagi terima kasih kepada khususnya Pak Sudari tentunya ya karena telah memimpin sesi presentasi dan juga diskusi dengan sangat baik. Selanjutnya juga terima kasih kepada para narasumber tentunya Dr. Rob, Dr. Regan, Mr. Steve, Mr. Steven, dan juga pastinya pembahas yaitu Prof. Aslan dan juga Pak Abe. Dan pastinya juga terima kasih atas antusiasmenya dari para peserta ya Bapak dan Ibu sekalian Seaweed Lovers karena sudah tadi banyak sekali pertanyaan namun uh, memang waktu yang uh, akhirnya harus memisahkan kita semua baiklah uh, kemudian saya akan memberi uh, pengumuman untuk lima penanya terpilih selama acara tadi ya yang sudah memberikan pertanyaan untuk mendapatkan merchandise dari TSIM jadi selamat kepada Ibu Santi Anggraini, Bapak Ahmad Purnomo, Bapak Wijayanto, Dr. M. Nasir Rofik, dan juga Bapak Bagus S.B. Utomo. Sekali lagi selamat kepada lima penanya terpilih, yaitu Ibu Santi Anggraini, Bapak Ahmad Purnomo, Bapak Wijayanto, Dr. M. Nasir Rofik, dan juga Bapak Bagus S.B. Utomo. Untuk yang terpilih, silahkan konfirmasi kemenangan Anda uh, kepada Panitia di 0811 13 28. Nah, selain itu, uh, tidak usah berkecil hati apabila Anda tidak menjadi penanya yang terpilih, karena setelah ini kita akan mengadakan kuis, ya, yang hadiahnya juga sama, yaitu akan mendapatkan merchandise untuk lima orang pemenang. Jadi, Bapak dan Ibu sekalian bisa mengikuti di Uh, ahas slide yang tadi ahas slide.com slash web tsin web tsinnya uh, caps lock semuanya itu uh, bisa di refresh kalau bapak dan ibu sekalian sudah masuk namun bila belum silahkan langsung menuju ke uh, website atau link tersebut ya ini coba kita bantu untuk di share di chat room supaya bapak dan ibu sekalian bisa ikut untuk uh, kuisnya ya, jadi berkesempatan juga untuk memenangkan uh, merchandise dari TSIM oke okay. dan uh, sebelum, dan juga bisa di scan QR code-nya dan uh, se sebelumnya mungkin untuk para narasumber apabila ada keperluan yang lainnya dipersilahkan untuk lift uh, terlebih dahulu. Sekali lagi terima kasih atas partisipasinya semuanya. Semoga kita bisa bertemu di kesempatan yang lainnya. Oke, okay. nah ini uh, bisa langsung join ya, bisa di scan di nya atau ke ahaslice.com slash webtsin. Dan di sini juga untuk nama, silahkan uh, klik Tuliskan nama underscore tiga digit terakhir nomor handphone Anda. Tapi kalau sudah masuk tidak masalah. Untuk yang belum ikutan silahkan uh, untuk username-nya bisa diklik nama underscore tiga angka terakhir nomor HP Anda. Oke mungkin kita akan tunggu sekitar hmm, berapa nih? 30 detik lagi ya. Jadi ini masih ada 160-an peserta nih yang masih bergabung. Silahkan untuk ikut kuisnya hanya lima pertanyaan saja. Jadi nanti saya jelaskan sistemnya sedikit, uh, ketika nanti akan muncul pertanyaan, jawabannya itu merupakan pilihan ganda, jadi jawabannya sudah tersedia. Kemudian silahkan klik jawaban yang menurut Anda benar dan klik submit. ya. Jadi kalau tidak diklik submitnya, nanti Anda jawabannya tidak terkirim, seperti itu. Dan untuk penilaiannya, untuk yang jawabannya benar dan yang paling cepat, akan mendapatkan poin yang lebih tinggi. Jadi silahkan Bapak dan Ibu sekalian, saya lagi, untuk uh, mengunjungi ahaslice.com slash web TSIN, seperti itu. Baiklah, masih kita tunggu mungkin 10 detik lagi. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Oke, okay. ada 33 player, mari kita mulai. Untuk jawabnya langsung di... Uh, linknya ya, jangan lihat di zoom, langsung di link oke, okay, TSIN adalah kepanjangan dari wah, yang mana nih, tadi kalau ikut dari awal atau mengikuti seri-seri sebelumnya, harus saya tahu nih
Oke, selanjutnya. Oke, jawabannya adalah Asparagopsis taxiformis. Baik, kita lanjutkan. Untuk ke pertanyaan ketiga, siapakah pembicara TSN Sense 5 yang merupakan CEO Future Feed dari Australia? Wah, ini gampang ya jawabannya kalau mengikuti atau melihat uh, di poster mungkin ya. Dan jawabannya adalah Dr. Regan Kruk, wah ini yang jawab Steve Miller nih, ta, uh, apa namanya, ketuker ya berarti ya, masih ketuker ya. Oke, okay. kita lanjut ke pertanyaan keempat. Berikut adalah data diversitas makroalga, makroalga ya, kecuali yang mana nih. Wah, ini lumayan spesifik ya pertanyaannya, tapi semoga untuk seaweed lovers harusnya Jawabannya mudah ya. Oke, jawabannya adalah 564 jenis atau spesies. Oke, dan pertanyaan yang terakhir. Program terobosan KKP yang bermuara pada keberlanjutan sumber daya kelautan dan perikanan nasional antara lain. Nah, ini silahkan. Apakah yang A, B, C, atau D itu semuanya benar? Dan jawabannya adalah semuanya benar. Oke, itu dia tadi uh, sesi untuk kuisnya. Dan kita lihat siapakah pemenangnya. Oke, selamat kepada Ibu Santi, Pak Alam, Ibu Adinda, Pak Suparjo, dan Pak Hamdani. Silahkan di screenshot ya, jangan langsung di close. Di screenshot dulu, kemudian silahkan kirimkan ke panitia. Saya lagi di 0811 13 168 28. Seperti itu. Jadi silahkan langsung dikonfirmasi kemenangannya. Boleh di uh, share screen-nya, boleh diturunkan. Oke. Okay. Baiklah, selanjutnya uh, itu dia tadi acara kita hari ini. Sekali lagi terima kasih banyak untuk Uh, seaweed lovers yang sudah dari jam, mungkin tadi sudah dari jam 12 ya, sudah dari jam 12, uh, standby sampai jam 3 ini, sekali lagi terima kasih, kemudian uh, silahkan untuk mengisi survei sekaligus absensinya di link yang sudah di-share juga di chat room ya, yaitu di bit.ly slash TSIN strip survey strip 5, seperti itu. Dan jangan lupa, karena uh, webinar ini bentuknya adalah series, jadi setelah yang kelima ini, kita masih akan ada yang ke-6, ke-7, dan ke-8, yang insya Allah akan dilaksanakan dari uh, bulan Oktober dan juga November, seperti itu, yang temanya sudah bisa dilihat di screen Bapak dan Ibu sekalian. Saya lagi ingin mengingatkan untuk mengisi survei dan pastikan penulisan nama Anda sudah sesuai begitu ya, karena e, nantinya data ini yang akan panitia gunakan untuk pembuatan sertifikat. Saya lagi terima kasih atas partisipasinya, mohon maaf apabila masih banyak kekurangan dalam penyelenggaraan ini, semoga ke depannya kita bisa lebih baik lagi dan bertemu kembali di TSIN selanjutnya. Saya Lara Sati Puspita Dewi selaku host undur diri. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat sore semuanya. Sampai jumpa di PSIN berikutnya. Selamat sore. Ya, thank you. Bye. Terima thank kasih. Bye, 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 Steve. Thank you. 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 Terima kasih juga kepada tim kita yang sudah menonton.